2017 meeting of the Merrimack School Board. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great job, guys. We're on to item number two, which is public participation. If anyone would like to speak, please come to the microphone, state your name and address for the record. And if you are a student, you just have to give your name and first name and grade. Seeing none, we'll close public participation and go on to the fun, which is item number three. We'll focus on student voice and inquiry at James Mastercall Upper Elementary School. So we invite to the table Principal Marsha McGill, Vice Principal Bill Morris, educators and students. So thank you for coming. Good evening, and thank you for inviting us to present our highlights from the 2016-2017 school year. Two years ago, during August Academy, the district designed professional development for teachers around the theme of inquiry. Throughout the school year, teachers engaged students in activities and encouraged them to ask the why and how about their learning. This past August, professional development focused on designing authentic learning opportunities for students with real-world application aligned to cross-content standards and goals. Tonight, we want to show you how the upper elementary, you know, integrates student voice and inquiry across the curriculum. Students will, will share inquiry-based projects that show how they worked and what they learned. We'll start this evening with a grade five science project. So we have Ms. Meehan, our science facilitator, and Mrs. Landry, a grade five teacher. Brought all of them, they did a wonderful job, but they took place in part of a human body project. They had to become experts of their field. They were given a system to research, and they had to um, research a disease, figure out a, a way to present a component of their project, a um, way to demonstrate, model, and they had to do all the research on their own, and they created a way to visually present it, whether it was to be a PowerPoint or a post or whatever worked for them. And I have four young ladies here that are between my room and my teaching partner, Ms. Ruffler's room. And they're about to kind of teach you a little bit about the digestive system. Girls ready? Yeah. Okay. Hello, my name is Rachel, and these are my partners, Sam, Ava, and Maddie. We are here to talk to you about the digestive system and how it works. The food journey starts in your mouth. Your teeth chomp the food down, and your saliva breaks it down. Well, how does your saliva break it down? Your saliva has enzymes that also help to break it down. If you would like to try our demonstration, you may, but before, let me explain. So you put a cracker on your tongue and let it get soft. If you would like, you can count until the cracker gets soft. Next, the food travels down the esophagus. This is a 10-inch tube the food travels down. The food is pushed down the esophagus by an involuntary muscle act called peristalsis. When the, sum, when, the stum, oh my God, when the food arrives in the stomach, acids from stretchy walls are added to help break the food down. The stomach is turning into food becomes a soupy liquid. Next is the small intestine. The small intestine is a narrow tube that loops around in your body. The small intestine is the largest part of your body, body and it's about 20 feet long. As your food enters the small intestine, digestive juices are added from the liver and pancreas. Lastly, the large intestine is the final stage of the digestive system. The large intestine is wider than the small intestines, but about five feet long. It has a smooth inside and there is no villi. Water in the waste is absorbed by the wall of the large intestine. The liver adds digestive juices to the stomach that help break down the food even more. The pancreas also adds digestive juices to the stomach to help break down the food like the liver. The rectum is where all the waste from the large intestine is entered. We have some true or false questions. True or false, does the gallbladder help with digestion? 
The answer is true. What does the stomach produce? The answer is gastric juices. What does the large intestine suck up? Proteins or water? The answer is water. Do proteins or fat travel down the digestive system faster? The answer is proteins. True or false? Is a food in your body you can't use called waste or feces? The answer is true. Here are some other systems the digestive system works with. The digestive system works with the circulatory system by the circulatory system giving the small intestine blood vessels. Then the blood vessels can take the nutrients to the liver. The digestive system also works with the muscular system. You would not be able to digest food without muscles. The digestive system also works with the skeletal system because the bones from the skeletal system protect with organs in the digestive system so they don't get damaged. from my classroom. I'm Mrs. Landry. I've got um, Noelle and Angelina and they're here to talk to you about the circulatory system. job is to circulate blood to and from the heart to the lungs and throughout the body. The heart pumps blood to the lungs where it receives oxygen. Blood vessels carry blood to and from the heart to the nutrients and oxygen. Just hold it. There, it's on. Next, we asked ourselves what we wanted to know more about. We wanted to learn more about what makes up blood. The job of the white blood cells is to fight any germs or diseases that get into your body. White blood cells prevent you from getting sick. The job of the red blood cells is to carry oxygen from the lungs to the rest of the body and carry carbon dioxide from the body to the lungs. Platelets are cells that help you stop bleeding when you get a cut. Plasma is a yellowish liquid that carries nutrients, hormones, and proteins through the body. Next, we have salt, because we have salt in our blood. And you guys need to... So we don't know. You guys are out of water. <coughs> Little technical difficulty here. You just grab that one by mistake. There you go. Is it easy? No. Parts of blood for us. No, we didn't say it, read it yet. Next, we asked what blood looks like, so we made a model. <coughs> we started with a jar of yellowish, yellow water. This is plasma. Next, we have red Cheerios to represent red blood cells. Then, we have marshmallows to represent white blood cells. Next, we have salt, because we have salt in our blood. Then we added red candies to represent platelets. <coughs> what do you do when you're sick? However, when you are sick, the body produces more white blood cells to fight the germs. their model of what the blood looks like. Okay. But then what did you want to do? Finally, we wanted to have a little fun and see if we could make edible white blood cells and red blood cells. Would you like to try some? <laughs> Who's feeling courageous? Let me go see if they would like a, red, a white blood cell. And would you like to pass out the red blood cells? Sure. They made these themselves. <coughs> And if you want to pass, you can just say pass, and they can um, just at least show you what it looks like. <laughs> and while 
while they're passing that out, I'm going to be turning the presentation over next to Mrs. Fay. You guys want to get set up? Hi there. Is this on? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Mrs. Fay. I teach fifth grade uh, at JMU's, and I teach science to my class and Mrs. Robinson's class. So I chose a student, CJ, from my class and Hannah from Mrs. Robinson's class to share with you what we spent a good part of January doing after um, we learned about forces in motion, which is part of our science curriculum. So. Um, after learning some of the uh, basics from Sir Isaac Newton and his laws, we thought about how we could use what we have learned to build a Rube Goldberg-inspired mousetrap. So the students were challenged to use uh, household supplies or scraps found around to create a mousetrap, and we um, researched Rube Goldberg a little bit and uh, looked at uh, what his inventions were like, and they tried to emulate that to create a device to catch a mousetrap. So I will let Hannah and CJ talk a little bit about the process they went through as we began. Yeah, you might want to, well, I don't, you can probably just, yeah. Or you can use that one. We're going to give you a microphone so people at home can hear what you're saying too. Thank you. Okay, so hi, I'm Hannah. Um, I'm talking about the steps we took to make this. There was a lot of trial and error. So first of all, we sketched out what we wanted to do for the mousetrap, and so we built what we wanted to happen. So then we tested it out, but it didn't work. So we went through some trial and error, and we finally found a model that worked, and we're hoping it does. <laughs> Yes, one thing we noticed when all scientists have to have at least one flaw, and we had multiple flaws when creating our <laughs> project, we had things such as we had to figure out the right angle for su such things such as the zip line and the ramp so that the, the ball we were using would create enough poten kinetic en energy going down so that when it hit the bucket, its weight and momentum would carry it down the zip line to, with also enough kinetic energy to hit our Capri Sun bucket <laughs> to make the mouse fall over. I had to make the bucket fall over. So we will now show you how such plan works. <coughs> Kick over the bucket. As you can see, it's a trial and error. We learned a lot about failing forward and, this, and, going, yeah. and going back to the drawing board many times. They went back and uh, adapted their sketches, and then at the very end, they each shared. We did a um, museum walk, and they each shared all their different mousetraps, and it was amazing. Some people did, like, kind of the maze on the, on the wall of the different tracks, and um, they really did a great job. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And next, I would like to turn it over to Mrs. Monroe. Okay, good evening. I'm, you can hear me. I'm Mrs. Monroe. I teach sixth grade at the upper elementary school. My PLT, when we were presented with this, um, we sat down and we were talking about what would work for CIA, our curriculum integrated activity time that was focusing around science and social studies. Our team decided to break into two, the science teachers, Mr. Tanner, Mrs. Labresh, I mean, excuse me, Ms. Um, T. Prins took the science route and Mrs. Labresh and myself took the social studies route. So the social studies teachers um, had decided that we were going to um, 
we wanted to come up with something that was inquiry based and that really the students led us. So we decided, because it fit into the curriculum very nicely as we're learning about cultures of the world, that we were going to focus on African countries. So what happened is we came up with guidelines for the students to follow. Now each of the four classrooms in our PLT had the opportunity to do the science piece during this round of CIA and the social studies piece as well. So the social studies piece is what we wanted to share with you guys tonight. So again, we came up with guidelines that were pretty open-ended. We knew that the end product we wanted um, would be an African coat of arms. What the students came up with is really what went on that coat of arms. Um, we knew that this was really going to be um, excuse me, inquiry-based learning because the students were asking the questions. That was driving what they were going to research, um, what pieces would be put in there as well. And I have two students from our PLT, Riley and Grace, who are going to talk with you about this process and share some end products. Um, my name is Riley, and um, for our um, for our um, coat of arms that we did about our African nation, we had the opportunity to choose a partner um, within our class, or we had the opportunity to work alone. Um, and we also had to pick an African country to research and learn more about that we wanted to learn what it was about and learn more about it. Um, and we had to choose um, some of the categories um, from education, recreation, food, housing, arts, music, government, history, climate, clothing, transportation, religion, sports, architecture, landforms, and culture. And um, we were able to choose some and put it on our coat of arms. Hello everyone, my name is Grace, and I'll be talking about what was put on our coat of arms. We got to choose a graphic organizer that we could put our research on. We researched an African country of choice using t books or text and also using online resources. We had four to five sessions to work on the coat of arms. So the country name and flag were two given categories. So at the top of our coat of arms was the country's name and in the middle of it was the flag. We got to choose four to six categories to research and then later put on our coat of arms. And we could also choose if we wanted text or if we wanted illustrations on our coat of arms for the final draft. In our final coat of arms were displayed in our PLT's hallway. So these were what some of the final coat of arms looked like. All right, that was our part of the presentation, and we are going to be turning it over to Mrs. Goodman. Hi, I'm Kathy Goodman. I'm representing our team tonight, which is 5T. Um, and with me tonight, I have brought some of my students, um, and they're going to share some, with some of their favorite slides from our tech book club. Um, so this year, I tried something new with book club discussions. Um, usually, I've had 
um, assigned the students their reading and they've had jobs or an assignment on paper which they fill out throughout the week and they bring it to their discussion but I did some research because I wanted to try to integrate technology into my reading and I found some great ideas to complete um, the, to integrate technology in reading I was really excited to get started um, so for this round I decided to use books that related to themes with our school's PBIS program or campaign at the time which was respecting yourself and others um, instead of using the paper assignments that I typically do, the students had jobs to complete on a collaborative PowerPoint using Office 365, which I felt really spoke to our 21st century learners. Uh, throughout this process, I helped my students grow as readers, but they also helped me to grow as a tech integrator. For example, these students learned to troubleshoot problems individually, collaboratively, and by the end they were even teaching me new things. So. Um, this weekly assignment gave these students opportunities to showcase their own thinking, their creativity, as well as to facilitate a discussion within their group without just reading from slides. Um, so tonight I have with me, my, from my Wonderstruck book group, um, written by Brian Selznick, Maggie, Noah, Colin, and Brendan. So they're gonna speak and then we're gonna show you some of their slides that they chose to showcase. Hi, I am Noah Bedard. I'm going to talk about how we got started. First, Mrs. Goodman had a book talk about several different books. She put us in groups based on our top three choices and if it was just a just right level. I chose Wonderstruck because it drew me in and I liked that it was split between pictures and words. I also wanted to read it because when I read the back, I was completely wanted to read it right away. In school, our PBIS focus was on respecting yourself and others. This book was fo focused on respecting yourself and persevering. Once we were divided into small groups, we met to discuss which jobs we wanted. My favorite job was media detective because I got to put pictures on what related to the book. We also got to put videos that also related to the book. Um, we got the pictures and videos from a safe search engine that came from Office 365. We had more jobs than just Media Detective, though. There, um, there was Vocabulary Detective, Illustrator, Quizmaster, Discussion Poster, and Trait Catcher. Throughout the week, we read our assigned reading and worked on our jobs. Sometimes we ran into problems such as PowerPoint problems and computers crashing, but we solved them by helping each other and consulting Miss Silva. At our book club meetings, we would come together to discuss the reading for the week. Our slides helped to share our thinking and gave us dis cause discussion points. For example, as the illustrator, I would draw a picture from a scene in the book, and then I would tell the others about what the scene is, and I would put a caption on the slide. After, um, after our meeting each week, oh, yeah. after our, eating, our meeting each week, we would have a self-assessment to fill out about how we thought we did in the discussion and on our job. This helps me by making me reflect on how well I collaborated in book clubs and how much effort I put into my slide. And it helped Mrs. Goodman because she got to see how we felt we did. We chose to show some of the same jobs to show you how we had some freedom and you could see our, um, how our own unique way of doing things stood out. I find tech book clubs a lot better than the other book clubs and because they're fun and they give you a choice about your learning and let you try new, th new and different things. It also teaches you responsibility. Here are the examples that we thought were best slide over the course of the five weeks. You can see like the discussion poster, um, some the way they chose to set it up. Some of them chose pictures. This is our trait catcher. So they used um, Wordle online to um, take different character traits about the characters and create that. Or someone chose to do this where they took a picture of the character and then just wrote it out. Illustrator, where they capture different scenes from their books and they use it as a talking point. The quiz master, the students used um, forms in Office 365. So the students would each be responsible for taking a quiz each week. 
and then they would report out on the results and have discussions about it. Oh, I'm so sorry. They would discuss. Um, they would discuss any kind of misconceptions that students had using the Quizmaster job. Now I am going to turn that over to Ms. Serenita and Mrs. Gruber. So thank you. Hi, I'm Tracy Gruber. I teach art at I teach art at the upper elementary. Yeah, your light is on. Yes. Um, during our CIA block, um, we co-teach Bookworks, which is an author illustrator workshop. Um, and this is a very rigorous inquiry based project. And it focuses on creativity, promotes growth in writing, and reinforces math practices. And we're going to turn this over first to Shaylin. During this class, which includes fifth and sixth graders, we are creating our own books. This is an intense, year-long process. The process include, included these steps, though not necessarily in this order, since this is not a linear process. Assess our skills and interests explore genre, purpose, and style, develop storylines, characters, settings, problems, and solutions, explore art media, including colored pencil, watercolor, acrylic, pen and ink, collage, and computer graphics, create illustrations, write text, select size, layout, and unique characteristics of individual books, storyboard, research, edit text and illustrations multiple times by ourselves and with peer and teacher conferencing and work on final text and illustrations. Hello, my name is Grace and I had an amazing opportunity to work in Bookworks. Before Bookworks, I didn't realize how much effort goes into such a simple picture book. First, we brainstormed ideas for our books. I had lots of ideas and my favorite idea was Fluffy and Friends Go on an Adventure. I started out with rough drafts and there was lots of editing, even for the drawings. As you can see, I've completed many drafts of text and illustrations to make my story better. The process of Bookworks has been great, especially learning so many new skills in writing and art. I enjoyed seeing all the changes in my drafts. Hi, my name is Chase, and on the slide I have my second draft of my writing process and samples of my illustrations in process. I have worked through countless rounds of editing my text, by myself, with peers, and with Miss Serenita. We have processed through several levels of editing, which has included several skills, including questioning the purpose of the, te question questioning the, purpose of the text, eliminating extra information, using quotations, sentence clauses, and so much more. Overall, the writing process has been an amazing experience. I've become a better writer and artist from my time in Bookworks. I love how when I'm editing, even though Miss Serenita has opinions, I still, I still feel like I'm in charge of making my own final decisions. Like writing, illustration also takes many rounds of edits. You can see on my slide copies of my current work in illustration. This picture shows one scene in all four seasons. As you can see, I'm leaning towards finishing my pictures with both, with both watercolor and colored pencil. My illustration process, in my illustration process, I feel proud of my artwork. In Bookworks, I'm, a, I'm able to bring one of my passions, art, into my school day, which makes school even more enjoyable. Hello, I am Shaylin. I have learned to declutter my writing by taking out unnecessary words. This helps my writing make more sense to my reader. I have also learned about sentence fragments and that how one or two sentence fragments in a story is okay, but a lot of fragments in a story will take away from the story. I have learned that I think editing is fun. You can see in my slide that I started in my sketchbook and I have progressed to heavily editing my writing. When editing with Miss Serenita, I like the feeling of making my writing better. 
I like the environment of BookWorks and how all of us are at different parts of the bookmaking process. And even though we are all at different places in the process, Miss Serenita and Miss Gruber can still help each of us with our books. Hello, my name is Liberty. I will be reading the two opening paragraphs of my story. A very long time ago, there lived a fox, an unusual fox. His pelt was speckled with fiery reds and oranges, and he was bright like the sun. The animals called him Day Fox. Day Fox was not what you would call a regular animal. He was given the responsibility to protect and guide the other animals, although that doesn't mean he was very good at this job. Every day at the crack of dawn, Day Fox would take his place in the sky. At this point in time, the sun was not yet a concept. So, instead of a sun to create day, his fiery pelt would bring lights over the horizon and paint the sky with shades of golds and reds, just as the sun does today. If framed perfectly, it would look like something right off of a canvas. This seemingly simple introduction actually required the most effort as do most beginnings to things. In order to start writing, I had to have a firm grasp on what my characters would look like and how they would act. Before beginning my writing, I had drawn out my characters Day Fox and Night Fox. Figuring out their physical attributes and their personalities helped me form their story. It has been a long time since I drew the original characters, and my text has changed quite a bit. So my characters have had to evolve in my story. Being in BookWorks has taught me so much about my writing, and I have enjoyed this creative process. Hi, my name is Lily. Mrs. Gruber and Miss Serenita have taught me so much about the writing and illustration process. You can see a very first draft and a thumbnail sketch of a page for my book and an image of part of my most current text. You can also see a picture of all my drafts. The whole text has changed a lot by rearranging the order of my sentences I made my imagery and emotion more powerful. Miss Serenita helped me so much through the process, and she says you can never have too many edits. This has been a long process to get to an almost final copy, but I enjoy coming to the art room in the mornings to make my story even better, and I hope I can do it again next year. I'm Zoe Swaljay. This is. I'm Peter Thompson. We're sixth grade social studies teachers on PLT Thursday, and we also were trying to come up with an inquiry-based project that involved technology, that involved rigor, that our students could do. So I was going to sing the Jeopardy music for you, but I don't really sing, so we're just going to skip that part. <laughs> but um, so basically, we gave the assignment that they, we gave them five categories. Each one, they'll explain it further. Um, of every category we've studied so far this year, and they had to come up with. Um, five questions per the five categories and each one getting increasingly difficult and then the final jeopardy being the most difficult and with the goal we haven't done that part yet where they play it with the class so each group in our class made a game and then you break your class into three groups so they each get the opportunity to write their answer and then everyone gets points so it's a really nice way to collaborate and use inquiry so this is Kylie and Isabella and they have the floor at the beginning of our project, we are giving five categories, South America, Central America, Canada, five themes of geography, and random. These categories were the units that we studied throughout the year. We were, ex we were expected to use inquiry to develop questions and answers that increased in rigor for each category. Through the process, we used our notes and our textbook to research what questions to use. You may be asking yourself, what is the difference between the $100 question and the $500 question? Your answer is rigor. Rigor is seeking something that seems simple and 
bringing it to the next level. We did that by taking our notes and turning our questions into answers and answers into questions. This, this is a $100 question from South America. So this is a South America question 100. So in South America, the answer is 400 million. And the question is, what is the population of South America? This is a $200 question from Central America. Spanish. And the question will be, what is the most common language spoken in Central America? This is a $300 question from Canada. The answer is Atlantic Ocean. And the question is, what ocean lies west of Canada? This is a $400 question from th five themes of geography. The answer is regions. And the question is, what are areas that share unifying characteristics? For example, states, towns, neighborhoods, etc. This is a random question for 500 and the head of the Canadian government. And the question is, who's the prime minister? This is our final Jeopardy. In New Hampshire, we all have snow tires. We, we build bridges that make transportation faster. FaceTiming our cousins in Hawaii. Ordering five books from Amazon. And the answer is, what are two examples of human environmental interaction what are, and what are two examples of movement? And last but not least, we present Mrs. Prince, Mrs. Garbars, Ms. Matsis, and Mr. Tyers. Hello everyone. Um, I am Mrs. Garbars. Is it working? Yeah, I don't know. Can you hear me okay? Okay. I'm Mrs. Garbars and I'm one of the sixth grade teachers from our PLT Wednesday group. I'm here with Mr. Tyers and Mrs. Prins and Mrs. Matsis. Um, and we have uh, two students here to highlight kind of the key um, components of our Enterprise City trip that we take. Um, it's kind of a, our key economics portion um, of our socialized curriculum. So Aiden and Molly are going to take it away from here. So basically, the first thing we do is we pick um, some jobs or a, a couple jobs that we are interested in and our skills apply to. And basically, lo we look at them and we see if we can um, handle them and which ones we like and which ones we could be successful with. And these are creating res um, resumes for... Um, interviewers and basically what we do is we fill out um, the information below and um, 
basically we show them to interview us and to see if we're fit for that job. We also had to do a job application. Um, we filled it out and we typed it on the computer and printed it. Um, there were some questions that we had to fill out, like um, some things that we do around the house or like what, what if we want to do manager or production engineer. Um, we also had to do interviews to figure out what our job would be. Um, so we would come in and they would ask us some questions and we answered them and they picked the job that would be best for you out of your top four. And these are voted, uh, going for mayor and judge and basically if you think you can um, handle um, being the boss of Enterprise City and uh, um, you would go basically for a little campaign and see if you can uh, see if people will vote for you and think you're trustworthy enough to um, handle in any price city. <laughs> and um, basically, and uh, we have uh, uh, different jobs in our shops, and basically each people have to do certain jobs to make their shops run uh, successfully to pay off their loan. Um, each shop created an advertisement. Um, the one up there is for the nature shop. We had to make a web page, a newspaper ad, a radio ad, and a sign. Um, our news or radio ad uh, was displayed. They set it over the radio um, during the Enterprise City Day. Um, and our sign we would have in our shop. The newspaper ad was obviously in the newspaper. And then the web page you could see in the um, technology Center. We also learn, learned about finances. Uh, we learned how to write a check, fill out a deposit slip, record transactions in our check register, registers, and use a debit card. Um, also, we vote on laws to make um, East City more safe. And basically, some of them were no walking on grass, um, walking only, no chewing gum, only eat snack in the snack area, Respe respect break times, and stay in shops. So, um, huh? Go to the next one. And the next one was business speeches. So basically, um, we take some speeches and we say them. Um, the owner will say the speeches of a summary of their shop to uh, get people to go there and uh, see what they have. Um, this is the judge and the mayor getting sworn in. Um, they had us come up and we had to swear to protect the city and they gave us big key. <laughs> um, that's the mayor at work. <laughs> She's filling out forms and um, rocking that tie. <laughs> Um, basically, this part is where we see if our shop is successful and see if we, um, we're working hard enough to pay off our loan. And basically, each shop, if they work together hard enough to get people to buy their stuff and they work together, they could, um, some people didn't get their loan paid off, but some people did. Um, and basically, it teaches you um, to work um, together to have a successful company. And um, these are just pictures of people at their job and what they do, I guess. Um, these are our people from the nat nature shop and the technology center. Um, the little They have tags on, and those would determine if they were going to the certain lunches or break times. These are the people from the newspaper and the sign shop. Um, these are people at the um, broadcast center and also at the wellness center in the sports shop. We also have the people from the delivery center and the manufacturing center. And these are the citizens of the bank. Um, we also have the multi-service center and the snack shop. And we have the utility workers. This is the DJ cranking some tunes. 
Um, and these are the people at the newspaper. Breaking news. Um, also, these are some things that you could buy at some of the shops and what they sell. And here are some more examples. Um, like at the snack shop, they sell some food. So, yeah. Um, this was our end the afternoon speech. Um, these are kids waiting for it to happen. Um, this was when we would go up. Um, we gave some certificates to the people who volunteered, and we fig we gave the certificates to the people who were able to fill out their loan. Um, and after, when we got back, we had to fill out a business reflection. Um, well, we filled it out. You'd write your business name if you made a profit. Um, just kind of. And that's it. Next, we'll turn the presentation over to Mr. Morris. So at, the, so at this time, we'd like to thank you for your time and the opportunity to share with you some of the ways that our students use their voice um, to demonstrate inquiry across the curriculum. Now with that, we'd, we'd like to, uh, we'd all like to entertain, entertain some questions, you know, if you have them. I will open it up to the board. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Um, Michael and Andy after that. I don't have any yeah. questions, but I just wanted to comment and say thank you to all the participants tonight and speaking. It takes a lot to come up and forward of all of us and and present what you did tonight. So I just appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah, I was I was going to say the same thing. I mean, all the different, <clears throat> all the way from like government and city all the way through all the different sciences and, and reading and everything else, a really good wide breadth. So I really enjoyed seeing all of it. So that was, I really want to thank for the presentation that you did. And I will say that um, the end of the line here is, he's a senior now, so he's not gonna be here next year, but he's a captain of our quiz bowl team at the high school. And for those Jeopardy kids that really like doing the quizzing, uh, there's a quiz bowl club at the middle school and any sixth graders can look into that next year, so. Um, you definitely learn quite a bit. You'll be you'll be ringers when you get up there. <laughs> so, you guys do a wonderful job every year. You you know we're so proud to have you representing our school and, and coming to the board. You learn so much, and I hope you really enjoyed your two years at the Upper Elementary School. Um, and for those fifth graders, you have another year to look forward to. I think there's a lot um, with Mrs. Serenita and the in the band and foreign language and all the new things that you learned. And you're in your building with your entire graduating class now that uh, it's probably very new and exciting for you and there's just more to come. So I hope you do enjoy school every day. I hope what we do here makes it, uh, you know, gives you the tools to, to really have a very fun and exciting year. And at the end of the year, you always show us, you know, all our work over here and, and how, it, how it pays off with some, some really good uh, results. So we're really proud of you and we thank you so much for coming to us and, and doing such a great job. So. Thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing some of you next year at the middle school presentation, and then we'll see some of you again next year at this one. So thank you. If you want to see a room empty. <laughs> So as we're setting up for item number four, we might turn up the heat as well.
So as we're clearing out, we will bring to the table um, item number four. We have the presentation regarding Primex Contribution Assurance Program. So our guests are Tony Fluelling and Carl Weber. Welcome, and thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed uh, the kids. Wonderful. Excellent. So when you're ready to speak, just make sure your green light is on and we're good to go. Let's try that again. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tony Fluelling. I work in the Member Services Department at Primex, and I'm joined by Carl Weber, who's the Director of Member Services. Um, just a little bit about Primex. We are a public entity risk management pool. We provide workers' comp coverage, property liability coverage, and unemployment compensation coverage to school districts, counties, municipalities, and special village districts throughout the state of New Hampshire. Another thing that Primex um, does is we provide extensive training opportunities. Um, we do a lot of um, training with our members, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, towards the end of the meeting. But um, our main purpose here is to talk about the Contribution Assurance Program, so I'm going to turn it over to Carl, and he's going to make reference to some items in your packet. Thank you. Um, on the right-hand side of your packet are the Contribution Assurance Program agreements, and we can describe a little bit about what this program is. Um, as Tony described, we're a nonprofit risk pool that provides coverage only to public entities in New Hampshire, and one of the things that um, a lot of our members had asked for was some stability over the long haul when it comes to contribution. They want to see contributions that are stable and predictable over time. And so for members who qualify, uh, we offer what we call the CAP program or the Contribution Assurance Program. What this is, is it's an agreement where you commit to the pool, you commit to your fellow uh, schools and cities and towns for the, uh, a few years, and in exchange, uh, we cap the total increase that your contribution can go up from year to year. It's not a guaranteed increase, it's a maximum. Uh, for folks who deserve less, who perform better than uh, that maximum, they get less than that. So we have lots of people, when we first introduced the CAP program a few years ago, called us up and said, well, you know, I signed up for this CAP program, why is my contribution lower than the CAP? And we said, well, the good news is you're performing better than the CAP, so you deserve less than that. Uh, we don't really have incentive to charge you more than what we need to collect for the pool to cover the cost of the claims each year. and. Over time, as years turn out better than actuary projections, we actually send that money back to members over time. And so if you look at the agreements that are in your packet, one's in red and one is in blue, the red is for the property and liability program, and that covers fiscal year 19 through 21, and it's a maximum increase of 7% each year. Uh, and the one that's in blue is for the workers' comp program, and you'll see that those are the same years, but it's a... 8% increase uh, maximum instead of the 7%. And when folks ask why is the workers' comp a little higher than the property liability, partly because the medical trend cost associated with workers' comp is a little bit higher than the trend within the property liability program. And so essentially in exchange for committing to the pool over the long haul, um, we guarantee that your contribution each year won't go over that maximum. Any questions on the... CAP program. Any from the board? Michael? Hello. Uh, I, this actually probably is not directed to you, but more of just a general. Are there other companies that provide this type of insurance that the school can use that also provides a similar CAP program? Um, I, I'm aware of the uh, New Hampshire Liability, Property and Liability Trust. They, they don't offer a program like this. Uh, we as a district were on the commercial market for around 30 years. 
through private carriers, both for, both for our workers' compensation insurance <clears throat> and for our property and liability insurance. And then we decided to, to shop it around, and, and Primex uh, was one of the lowest uh, carriers around. And them offering this cap program to give, a, give us some security over the years for budgeting purposes, much like the trust does with health insurance with the GMR every year so we can budget properly. And the way they came to our rescue after we first signed with them, because if you recall, I think uh, something by the name of Hurricane Sandy blew through and took the top of the special services building off, and that was our first year that we were with the Primex, and their level of service was absolutely outstanding. So that's just a, a little tidbit of information for, for your information. Right. But no, this, there's no other that offer this type of service that I'm aware of. I guess just a follow-up question. How long have we been with Primex, and do we still shop out to just keep them in check? Um, we have not shopped out. We've been, it's been around almost five years now. We haven't uh, bid it out since, since that point in time because the, the private market was so much more than this at that time. We've just kind of kept on going along. Yeah, thank you. Um, I only had one question, and it's on the cap rates. Is that standard when you do present the cap rate opportunity for a, uh, an entity, or is it based on the historical claim trends that we have, we've uh, submitted? Um, it's based on when we do different cap offerings, the percentages have varied over when the cap offerings are. Right now, the cap offering that we're doing throughout the pool are the, the 7 and the 8%. It just really depends on sort of how things look and are forecasted out over the years. Okay, um, so it's, it's like a collective rate, so it's not like Merrimack put in so many claims, so they're getting 7 where maybe someone that doesn't put in claims gets 2 or something. No. Okay, because you know, obviously we put a claim pretty quick with you, <laughs> with that with that Sandy um, situation. I do remember that you were very responsive, and, and we do thank you for that. It was it was something we weren't expecting, obviously, and it, it was, got taken care of very quickly. It's not a way to start a new business relationship. Mm -hmm. Let me just or maybe it, it was. Way. I mean, or maybe it <laughs> was. It. <laughs> Things got handled, and they got handled quickly and, and thoroughly. So, so that. That's that's a testimony to your service, and we thank you for that. You're welcome. And, and re we're really here on behalf of the member, and, and Tony can speak a little to the uh, – on the left-hand side of your packet, you're going to see there are lots of um, services and training offerings that we provide. One of the things that we learned early on, Primex has been around for almost 40 years, and um, we've learned that lots of training, education, and consultative site type services help you bring your risk down over time. because. The better you train your employees, the better you manage your risk, the lower your contribution will be over time because you, you're going to lower that risk. And we went back, and Tony can speak a little bit to some of those services, but also some of the training we've done over the years for you as well. Yes, thank you. So on the second page on the left-hand side of your packet is a flyer that says Legals and HR Services. Um, this is um, a service that we provide to our membership. We provide contract review if you have any um, relationships with outside parties. Um, we're happy to review the insurance and indemnification sections of those agreements um, prior to signing on any agreements. Um, we also have legal counsel and HR consultant full-time employees on staff at Primex. For any of your employment-related questions, it's sometimes a nice phone call to just make before you take any employment-related um, action. Employment-related practices are the biggest part of our property liability program, the most we spend on claims. And if you do human resources functions well, um, you tend to have a positive outcome for everyone that's involved in the process. Um, other training that we do, um, we have the Foundry. I'm not sure, um, Marge, I know you've um, experienced the Foundry. I'm not sure if anyone else has had the opportunity to look at our Foundry. Um, it's basically a state-of-the-art training facility. We try to do classroom um, training, but we also then like to have folks practice what they're learning. It's a safe environment, but it kind of puts a little bit of pressure on you. But folks say that it was a better training process um, when it's all um, said and done. Um, we also have a lot of online classes. We are also doing webinars now. We probably do about three or four a year. Um, we have our Supervisors Academy program for up-and-coming supervisors, as well as um, our Emerging Leaders program. So those are two very popular programs. Um, so we certainly encourage folks to participate when they can. Um, we also have a list of property and liability training classes. Again, this more is more geared for the human resources um, questions we get. We, lots, we get lots of questions 
questions on FMLA, the Family Medical Leave Act, and these are all trainings that we can provide on site to our membership or we provide this training um, at our facility in, in Concord. Um, any questions on any of the, the training resources? Um, as Carl mentioned, the training resources and consultation is a really a big part of the membership. It's all part of the membership. I think that's a lot of the value added that folks find when they're with Primex than with the, in a commercial carrier. Um, you get a little bit more one-on-one um, -on -one attention um, when you call Primex. Cindy, you had a question? Um, I just wanted to check with our administration to see if you're using those services, if we've been reaching out and taking advantage of um, some of the services that they offer. So the answer is yes. Um, since the Emerging Leaders Program has begun, um, we have um, put a name in every single year and have had a participant and the participants have gone forward in their careers. For example, Michelle Romaine was the first participant as a language arts coordinator and next year or right now she's the principal elect of Master Co Elementary School as an example. The current participant is Fern Seiden who is a school counselor at Thornton's Ferry Elementary School. Um, approximately three weeks ago um, we had Mike Ricker and Kate Spillane, the two attorneys um, that were just mentioned, came to the leadership table and we had um, particular queries that the leadership team members had were answered by the two. Recently we had a personnel question. We wanted um, to give Linda some additional reinforcement so Carol Kilmister um, was called to the fore as well as several of the trainings have been utilized by Tom Tussaud and company uh, for maintenance. So um, I would say we are proud users of the services that Primex has to offer. Great, thank you. Any other questions from the board? Michael? Um, I, the services sound wonderful and I, I think that the, with the cap it definitely obviously adds a benefit in uh, security for the taxpayer. Um, this is back to the administration. Um, I would think that every few years we should review it um, out in the open market just to obviously show the benefit uh, overall to the taxpayers here too. Uh, I think that obviously it's not just price as they've clearly identified. Um, obviously there's some security for each cap and also um, some of the services that I think they provide some overall benefit not just the price point but I I'd like to see that. So thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Okay. And there's, there's one more piece, uh, Absolutely. if I can, uh, behind your agreements. There's a program called the Prime Program with, that you don't currently participate in, but we're going to encourage you to participate in this. Um, what this is, is what we found over the years is uh, members who, uh, we've created this checklist of 10, 10 best risk management practices throughout the pool for members who um, yearly go through this process they sort of become certified in prime. And it's things like benchmarking your losses and having an active joint loss management committee. So a lot of things you're probably already doing. One of the big differences is every year looking at your losses and benchmarking to say, if this is where our losses are, where would we like to get them to next year? And in exchange for that, we actually take 2.5% off both your workers' comp and your property liability, uh, which results, it's about $8,700 off. Uh, and that would go into effect whenever you achieve this. Uh, but there's a selfish reason why you should do this beyond the 2.5% discount. We're tracking prime members in the pool against non-prime members right now, and they're actually tracking 7% better in performance than the, their peers. And 7% less means they're also paying 7% less. And so, again, it's a good way to just stay engaged and look at your losses on a regular basis and set some benchmarks. And so we'd recommend that you consider that. Um, you know, as we went through some of your losses, you know, your largest loss area is slips and falls, which we've done some extensive training over the years. But we think that you could probably make some real headway with some suggestions and some ideas that uh, risk management, the risk management folks have about ways to prevent those in the future. Uh, and so we'd recommend that you consider uh, putting that on the, your list of things to accomplish, and we think that it will help you just sort of stay ahead. What we find is members who are really engaged with their losses really make good pool members because they um, really are attentive to that loss history every year. Excellent. Any questions on the program? No. Um, I guess I'll just follow on uh, Michael's question and ask, because I'm assuming that you are not in the bubble of your, your space. Um, historically, where have you seen your rates at, you know, I know the private sector is essentially the next step for, for coverage 
going into what the you Anya know, Corporation would do, I assume. So where, where are your rates as compared to what we see on the open market? Um, <clears throat> well, one of the reasons why pools were created in the first place was uh, in the late 70s, the commercial market grew tired of the risk associated with public entities. So they just started to drop coverage. Or if you had a high loss ratio, they would drop you from coverage. So pools were created. New Hampshire was one of the first in the nation to create one. Uh, now they were created all over the state, uh, all over the 50 states for public entities. And essentially it's like a big cooperative, nonprofit. Um, so when we compare against that, we typically are less because we're a not-for-profit entity. We add a lot of value services to bring your losses down. Uh, but also our coverage uh, on our property liability is written in-house for our members. So what they typically have to do is cobble together lots of different providers in order to provide your cyber liability and your public officials liability and your employment liability where we're just writing that sort of in-house to say here's what your coverage is and so we find that ours is more tailored to what the public sector needs and <coughs> both the training and the consulting is designed to really address your loss the other benefit of being in a pool is even if you have some bad years uh, the pool will buffer those for you that we essentially use a five-year window of your losses, which gives you real stability over time, which mm -hmm. means you can also have a bad year or two and it doesn't really crush you in your rates, where if you ever have you know, your car insurance, you get an accident and your insurance goes way up. Here, you, know, you can have a bad year and your rates will still be pretty stable uh, over the long haul. It's gotta be fair and equitable to the pool, but you can have a bad year or a bad few years and it really doesn't spike dramatically from year to year. Uh, our pooled rates, uh, don't change much from year to year because it's a pretty predictable and stable market. Um, you know, we have a majority of the public entities in the state, and so that makes it for a nice stable uh, compared to some ebbs and flows within a commercial marketplace. Okay. Michael, do you have a follow on to that? Yeah, please. Um, so I, I just, maybe some clarification. Uh, I actually feel very confident that this administration is picking the right insurance for the district. I by no means um, want to put that out there. Uh, I just feel that if just a check here and there, and this is more for the administration, sorry, um, it's just beneficial so that the, the public in, in general knows that we're not becoming complacent, which I definitely do not think any of it, but he is. It's just more of a, yes, we are checking it. Uh, I definitely understand a pool, and I think that obviously uh, with insurance, you can definitely get dropped very quickly in the commercial space. Um, uh, at least as a homeowner. I know I'm not so much <laughs> understanding a school district, but I just want clarification there. I think that we likely have the best insurance rate that we probably have, just a little checks and balance, that's all. If I could say yeah. one thing. Absolutely, Matthew. Yeah, J just as a bit of history, when, um, when I was going through the process and we arrived at Primex uh, for a carrier, um, the commercial market was less and less available to us. Used to have travelers, Hanover, uh, a bunch of other carriers way back in the day. And then one by one, they all kind of dropped off. So I think the only one really left was Hanover Insurance. That was the last experience I had. And plus, please correct me if I'm wrong on this, because we're part of an insur insurance exchange, New Hampshire Primex, the total liability, if we get sued for anything, is only $275,000. That's the max. So we're not going to be getting hit with these million-dollar liability-type lawsuits. Is that correct, Carl? The, the other protection in the statute as being part of a pool was since you are collectively sharing the risk with fellow tax-funded public entities, there are certain immunities that allow you to sort of get cases dismissed right away, and then there are statutory caps on the total uh, damages for liability, which are 275 per incident or 925 as an aggregate. And so there is some protection where, let's say you were the commercial market and you had $3 million worth of coverage, they can sue you for $3 million. Here, you're capped at that 275. And it was really seen as a way so that public entities would sort of have a mitigated um, liability when it came to some of these lawsuits. And so it, that is one of the big protections in being in a pool. Michael? So I guess um, that's great information. I appreciate that. I, I, maybe it's just beneficial to have that along with packets in the future so that 
more information to help myself or others to understand that. But that's great information that, again, shows the additional benefit for Primex. So thank you. Great. Are there any other questions from the board? We thank you for your time and your thank service you so for our district. Thank you. Very much. So thank you. So um, along the lines of this agenda item, I think that we're looking to, um, in our package, we have a memo from MAP, and looking to see if we wanted to lock in what we would call the protection caps for the next three years. Um, if this is something that is not amenable to the board, or uh, let us know, or if not, we will plan to vote on it. At that point, would be consent, I assume? I was prepared to to do whatever the board wished but was not expecting any decision tonight right tonight was a presentation from Primex so that you would know what they offered um, so at some point in time we just need to respond I would say we just need to say back to Primex we're not interested in the cap program so perhaps you could um, give me an answer on the 5th of June and I would just make it an item okay, okay. so if you want to make an item as far as you want, an agenda item or a consent do you think is appropriate? I, I would do whatever you will. I think at one point in time um, I thought that uh, perhaps this program would be beneficial um, given the cap. Um, yet tonight um, I hear Mike talking in terms of um, kind of taking a look around so we can't lock in with Primex if we need to be looking around. So I just okay. perhaps do you, do you so, have kind of a thought about that? We were doing this program now because mm -hmm. it seemed we've had some experience and I think Primex thought it would be beneficial to us um, for a longer term. But I'm happy to go in either direction. Okay. So um, if I definitely think we want this on the next agenda item, or the next agenda on June 5th. If we feel that we're agreeable to going with the cap, we can put, uh, we can schedule it for consent Anything put on consent um, that we feel needs more vetting and more discussion can always be pulled off as an individual agenda item uh, for, for uh, further uh, discussion. So um, at this point, I would say we, we would put it on consent. If for any reason um, you want to take an off consent for actual deliberation, then we can, uh, we can pull it and just let Marge and I both know. And when we formulate the agenda, we can do that. Naomi? Yeah, thank you. Um, to be honest, I'm, I'm a little confused at the moment what we'd be voting for versus not. We'd be voting to um, engage in a three-year CAP program. So it's an agree both of those um, documents were agreements to participate in the CAP program, which means we commit to Primex for the next three years. And so we would sign an agreement of commitment to them for three years, which would l limit our um, increases and maximize it. Zeb? If we don't agree to this, if this specific agreement, um, the following meeting, will there be something like, does our does our previous agreement end now? Is that what we're voting on this new one, or no, will it, we just continue with our old one if we don't vote yes on this? It just doesn't offer us a cap, which means that if you know things go above because of the risk pool, then we could be paying more than the seven or eight percent if we choose not to go with that program. Naomi, and then Na Cinda. Sorry, um, I think that the part that I'm least clear on it is which seems most advantageous to the administrators. Was this something that you, you wanted or didn't want, or was it that it was a good idea and now there's more question because of the conversation? I think uh, Matt and I sat uh, with Tony Fluelling initially, and I think we thought we'd had enough experience with Primex over time that it seemed to make sense. Um, and we are using uh, now a lot of the services that are being rendered. You know, it takes a while to get underway. Uh, and so I thought, think we thought it was a good time. In addition, um, they talked in terms of the prime member self-assessment program. We thought that was beneficial as well because it puts us more in control of our own destiny, meaning they know that slips and falls have been something that we've had difficulty with. So they're anxious to work with us to try and eliminate that. So between the education, the services, and the fact of capping, we thought all of that um, was a good offering to put before you. But we um, need your authorization to be able to go forward. As you could see, the resolutions need the signature of the chairman of the board. So we needed to put it before you for consideration. Thank you. That's much clearer. Okay, and then send it to Michael. 
Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, regarding the three years, um, I'm comfortable with that as the maximum that we would go. I think we usually do not go more than three years because that is the, the possibility that there could not be one of us still. It's the maximum term of school board members and so on and so forth. So the three-year term um, um, looks good to me. Um, so basically the advantage of going with the three years, it sounds like, is to be able to lock in the rate that we would get um, based on our experience, right? Yes. And Michael? Um, yeah, so I, I guess, I mean, it sounds good on paper to me, but I'm not sure if it sounds good based off of history. So without historical data for the past five years of the increase that we've seen year over year, it, it doesn't give me enough information to actually make an informed decision. So I, I think that a couple things that are kind of pointed out to me is that I, I really, I guess I need to have a conversation between now and the next meeting to better understand the history of insurance so that I can make an informed decision there and then also understand the five years of increase that we've seen with Prime X to see if it's a benefit to, to even sign this too. Um, it, it sounds like it is. Uh, it sounds like since it's a pool, it, it makes sense. But uh, there's a couple items that I think more information is needed for me. So I think based on the discussion tonight, why don't we just make it a regular agenda item instead of Fine. let's just skip consent altogether. Um, in our packets, we can have ready the five-year uh, rates that were charged for the two different programs, the uh, Workman's Comp and the and we will go from there and, and see where our rates are, are trending. And and um, I don't know, Matt, if we have the availability to see the risk pool rate. So we know that, you know, where we are versus, you know, other member districts, if we can look at the overall rate, the collective rate, and see how far that's gone up. So we can look at ours in, in, compar in comparison to the state of New Hampshire or other membership, which is sounding so incorrectly done. So. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It just sounded terrible. I'm not going to lie to you. It's the worst grammar I ever had. <laughs> Cinda. I, I agree that it's helpful to get that context before um, we vote on consent. If sure. nothing else, to see the trending um, and, and any other information that can provide context to us that Matt can provide would be helpful. Um, just kind of repeating what Michael said, I think, to know that typically on the commercial, markets this is what you kind of see this is how we've saved money this is why um, we want to go with them and continue with them I think it's I don't have any concerns as is but I think it's just good to get that information out there so that um, there's just more context surrounding our decision okay Michael and I'll just reiterate I, I think that what they presented tonight probably is not even available in many commercial if I'm to guess so so just having that information also just helps to educate us plus mm -hmm. the, the audience so thank you excellent so we have a plan for june 5th yeah. yep. excellent so we will move on to item number five which is the update on the 2016-2017 preschool and projections for 2017-2018 i invite to the table john fabrizio and sheila demers Good evening. How are you? Um, I remember well the uh, beginning of Prime X and the roof going off special services. Um, yes, that was quite the call in the morning. Yes, it was. So um, we're here this evening to talk about um, a couple things. Um, one is uh, to talk about um, indicator 12, which is um, I've been to the board several times and talked about some of our indicators and how we get um, scores on them from the um, from the state, uh, which comes down from the government. I'll explain that in a little bit. But um, it's kind of a, a great thing to show that we are, um, when you take a snapshot in time and look at kind of where we are with um, providing for our students um, coming into our school district, we are still at a 100% um, compliance in that. And um, we have a nice letter from the, the state that I provided in your packets. And, and where this indicator comes from is, is it's very interesting. Um, it's kind of a, a long process, but I think it's important that I, I point it out to the board. I think that um, special education oversight has many layers. It starts with the, the, the U.S. Department of Education. It goes to the Office of Special Education and Real Rehabilitative Services. 
It goes to Office of Special Education Programs, then the New Hampshire Department of Education, then the Division of Educational Improvement, then to the Bureau of Special Education, down to the SAUs, down to the school district, and us, and then to our local schools themselves, and then kind of back up when we get our reports. And on indicator 12, which you see before you, it really talks about percentage of stu students referred prior to the age of three who are found eligible and who, ha who have to have an IEP developed. So I'm going to have Sheila in a minute talk about kind of her role when it comes to child find and how do we start that process of bringing students into our building, in, in, into our three buildings now this year, which has kind of been a nice expansion. And I think in doing so, um, it takes a lot of work from a lot of factors, and I'm going to just say that when you look at our report that we recently received, it shows that we continue to have um, zeros on this report, and I said it's the only report that I like to get a zero on, I said it's every year because it tells us that we had zero instances that they have found that were beyond what which should have happened. They were all done correctly, so it's 100% of, of compliance in that, that area. So I'm going to turn to Sheila before we start talking about our current state of preschool numbers and enrollment and where we sit. I'm going to have her first of all talk a little bit about kind of how students come into our programs. So Sheila? Sure. Well, John asked me to talk a little bit about the child pine process in my role in the process as preschool coordinator. First of all, um, for children who might have special needs, I, I take in information from parents uh, regarding concerns from the about the child. Um, sometimes those intakes come, those referrals come in from parents. They can, could come in from child care directors, teachers from our own preschool, our MEEP program. They might have concerns about some of the typical children in the class. They sometimes come in from physicians, and they also come in from early intervention programs. Um, there's an early intervention program called Gateways that is based out of Nashua, and they make referrals to us as well. So I coordinate the process from the intake for the child, to, um, develop assessments for the children to determine eligibility for special education. My team develops an IEP if needed and uh, recommends appropriate programming for the child if they're found eligible. We um, support the family through this process because they have a lot of concerns with their children and we assign appropriate team members to determine the needs of the students and then deliver services that are appropriate for the students. Another thing that we have to do is to determine appropriate placements for those students um, to find a free, free appropriate public education for each preschooler and then provide state required ratios to make sure that we have more typical children in each of our classes than the children that are identified with special needs. I want to talk a little bit about the referral process because it's different for children that are referred from early intervention services than it is from um, parents that have concerns. First of all, students who um, receive early intervention services or EI services are generally referred to the school district when they reach 27 months of age. So they're just a little over two years old and then they uh, would send a referral packet to me to start the process. Sometimes parents don't give permission for that packet to be sent to the school district. So sometimes we don't receive their referral until they're 32 to 34 months old. So it's right before three and we still have to develop the whole process by age three for them. And once we receive a referral, we have 14 days to discuss the child's needs and meet with the parents to determine what to do with this referral. Generally, we would have to do some further testing or at least do an observation for the child. Um, once eligibility is determined for special education, we develop an IEP, and then we dis discuss placement options with the families. Um, the team assists the parents and coordinates services with the child care program if they're attending child care because a lot of times um, the child might be in child care full time and then we're saying that he qualifies for our preschool program but we have to kind of coordinate the services because 
we can't just say, you know, starting tomorrow you have to come to our school. So we kind of have to work it out, which might even entail providing transportation to receive services. So there's a lot to it. And then students who are referred from um, parents, usually they could be from age two and almost three, two and a half to three, all the way up to um, just this week we've had a few referred to us that are five, five and a half, um, just ready to go into kindergarten and then we'll get a referral saying, when we are kind of concerned with these children and we want you to, to test them. So all throughout the year we're receiving referrals. Um, usually those intakes come through the telephone, um, they either call me or it might email me, and then again we'll start on um, assessments for the child. We have a child find team that meets on a weekly basis, and we evaluate the child if they have concerns, um, and maybe just in speech, we also would meet to um, evaluate the child in the areas of cognitive, speech language, adaptive, social, emotional, fine and gross motor skills. And then we would com um, devise a, co a comprehensive re report. We do this all within an hour and a half period for each week. Um, so the child comes in and they meet with multiple people, do quite a few assessments, and then we develop a report. And then we meet with the parent after. That could be, if it's very mild, it might be through a cone, uh, phone conversation. And then sometimes um, we have a, a, a whole meeting with the parents. Sometimes we need to do further assessments as well. Do you want me to talk about the growth, or should we wait on that? We'll go. We'll, I'll, I'll go forward. Then. Okay. Back All right. Thanks. Thank so, why we're here tonight? Um, on top of uh, celebrating our wonderful compliance report, we're here to talk about next year's enrollment numbers. In your packets, I, I provided you with, um, Sheila and I provided you with the um, history of our enrollment from 2010-11 to where we sit projected for 17-18. And if you look at those enrollments, you will see that when we began this process back in 10-11, um, we were looking at a total of about 80 students in our district. And that was over, that was really over two buildings. And um, prior to that, I remember the days of 40 students in our, in our preschool program. And now, um, if you look at the number projected to come in, we're at 135 students projected to come in for next year. And right now, we're sitting about 136, and I believe Sheila just said she had three more referrals this week. So even from the time the packet was written, we're having more students enter into our buildings and, and go through the process of evaluation and determination. And you'll also know when it says there's a, there's a, there's a um, back column that says coded, and that's really students identify with a disability, and it means they're given a code uh, basically on the disability. And we have we have started with as you'll see 28 students uh, back in 10-11, and now it is uh, 63 students projected to come into the school year to start. So the growing population of those students and and who they are sometimes in their need is as important as that number. And I think that that number tells a story, it doesn't tell the whole story. And I think when you look at the number, we've had a severe um, increase in population of students with, with, with autism disorder. And we have talked about that before around the table. There's now statistics that support that, and we are seeing it here in our early education program. Um, and what that, um, what that impacts is our ratios. And you'll see our ratios that we try to keep our ratios again. 60% of kids they call kip typically developing against students who have an identified disability. And we keep those ratios. We also have to keep our numbers, try to keep our numbers between, on, we like to keep them around 12. We stretch from 12 to 14 in some of our classes this year because we've had need and kids moving in. And we have what we have at this point. Um, moving into next year. We have, again, an increase in numbers, and we have an increase in need. And in both those factors, what we're requesting from the board is the ability to um, utilize a current staff member who is Jerry Ananastas, who is both certified special ed and is a, and is a board, saver, board, excuse me, a BCBA, board certified behavior analysis. And Jerry's uh, ability to be able to uh, be a BCBA allows her to set up programming for kids with, with need and autism, to set up uh, programming for the kids within her classroom, but now we want to utilize her role to go beyond her classroom 
and kind of spread out some of our students of need so they are experiencing more of an inclusionary uh, educational opportunity. In doing so, what we would ask for is a half-time teacher to fill Jerry Ann's position in the afternoon to teach the class that she typically would have this year, and then another half-time to be over at Master Cola Elementary School to again deal with some of the increased numbers of 135 students. So that was what the request is, and along with that, as we've talked about at this board, there has to be an opportunity for uh, more than one adult when you're working with three-year-olds. And when you put 12 three-year-olds in a room, one adult, not enough. <laughs> we need paraeducators to help support those. A lot of these kids have need. They have behavioral needs. They have toileting needs. They have functional motor needs. And we need our very well-trained paraeducators who are currently in Master School Elementary School to become not at, at half-time positions, to become full-time positions. So. All in all, between all of those positions, there's four positions. There's there's two new positions, two half-time uh, special education teachers, and then there's two paraeducators to be increased. The total um, increment for that amount of money that we are requesting to make that happen is eighty thousand dollars, eighty thousand five hundred and eight dollars to make that happen for us. To uh, um, hopefully, uh, the board will consider this, and then we will move. Um, you know, over the next two weeks, and then we can move to uh, a point of advertising and hiring to start support us for um, the incoming school year. And um, finally, I just like Sheila want to talk about kind of um, preschool growth and how how really students develop and how they grow. And I think it's important for our process to understand about why we need the integrated preschool program and why it's important to do this in an inclusionary aspect. So, Sheila. Just have a few highlights of um, of the spring and and all the growth that's happened. This spring, we've had ten students transition to the MEEP program from early intervention. That's been since February. Uh, Fourteen new students are slated to need the MEEP programming from July through September. These are new students from early intervention that we hadn't planned on. Um, and early intervention has recently informed me that they have 15, at least 15 children slated to in, from Merrimack to transition to the school district within the next school year. Right now we have four. Um, in the four-year-old class, we had seven students in their four-year-old year, this coming year, who were just identified within the last few months as well so sometimes we have typical students in our classes and then we find out through the school year that they're delayed as well so that kind of changes the ratios and then we have to develop IEPs for those students as well um, this year we've done uh, through our child find screenings we have uh, uh, we have assessed 37 students and um, 19 were of those 37 were I uh, found to have special needs Two moved away before finishing up the eligibility process, and then three more are scheduled to be assessed during the next few weeks. We had five newly identified students um, since March that we found eligible and that we've placed in community settings because the, we didn't have any more room in our three-year-olds, and we were trying. We did start a play group for one day a week, but some of these students need more than we could offer at that point, so we are placing them in community settings and um, offering them speech therapy in the settings where they are We're trying to be creative to offer different um, programs for these students. We've also had a, a large increase in children with significant behavior challenges. I know John mentioned the autism, but there's many children that have behavior challenges and just can't be housed in a child care setting um, from safety risks and running and just overall behavior risk so that's why we've been consulting to the programs and trying to help them because a lot of these children get bounced from program to program they can't be successful in any child care program so we try to help by sending staff in the occupational therapists behavior st um, specialists myself to help them to keep the children in child care we've also had five preschool students who have been approved to be retained in preschool for next year. So that will, again, will uh, raise our numbers in the preschool program. And some of those students 
almost all of them require full day programming because either they have autism or they have some behavior challenges that require full day programming in preschool. Um, I think I've covered everything. Yep. And now, um, any questions you have for us about the proposal? I have Andy and Michael so far. So th thanks. It's always good to see this, this update and see the request <clears throat> that you put before us. As you know, I have some experience with this program from way back when. He's 21 now, almost Is 21, so you can imagine how far back it's been. One of the concerns I have is when you listen to some of the, the community talk about this, um, one of the things that they don't, that isn't understood as well is the blending of, of kids that have IEPs that are coded and the ones that aren't. Mm -hmm. um, and you could see if you're looking at the ratios here, Reed's Ferry um, tends to have more more of an even match, you know, historically. I mean, that's where, where it started with Kids Inc., you know, a long mm -hmm. time ago. Right. Um, and the other schools is, is gone. Um, the, the ratios that you're using that, that are showing up here are sort of at the high, and you gave a range of, um, f like, I think the, what you said in your memo here is that you try to do six, enroll, practice enroll six to seven typical students in each class along with five to six students with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And the ratios that you're showing here or at the bigger end of that, I think I calculated to 1.4. So for every uh, every student that's coded, there's 1.4 students that are normal, or not normal. I'll use that word typical. wrong. Not coded or typical. Or typical I think yeah. is the word you used. The concern I have as we move forward is, I do not disagree at all with the way that, that you're seeing more kids identified with issues of the varying, whether it's on the autism spectrum or whatever. My concern is as a board member that we make sure that we have the resources to deal with those that are identified in the, in the district. And I understand the need to blend normal students, but I would prefer as we see more kids being identified that we not sacrifice them being in, but maybe try to even out the ratio between the, in the blend, as opposed to having 1.4, maybe a one-to-one -one as we go through to see more of this even blending. I know that there's probably statistics that say it's better to have more typical than atypical, but we're going to reach a point in terms of funding and, and resources where we may not have that luxury in the future. So my, my only thought, I, I, I completely support what you're looking for because I think the numbers, even with the coded numbers, are the ones that are driving mm -hmm. your need. But I'd like to see as we go forward and we look at projections in the future, and as a, I know there's parents that want to get into the MEET program that don't have kids that are coded. I, I hear that a lot. Right. But I also want to make sure that we're also have the capacity and we spend the money to deal with the, the children that need it. So it's so my only caution is the, the blending and the ratio to try to be more even over time if we can do that so we can handle what we need, really need to address. So. I don't think I mentioned we have 14 students on a wait list, typical students as well for next year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The key is, is when you, if you bring in more and then you get a, get a burst of coded in there, you've used your buffer up, right? right? And that's that's a concern I've got. Mm -hmm. We see that sometime in the summer with the superintendent will say, we had 47 first graders register last week. <laughs> you wonder why they all came. Right. And then sometimes mm -hmm. we have to do things with staffing. Right. This is not, it's not predictable by any stretch, but there are things you can do for planning to sort of be able to have a little bit of flexibility to do it. So mm -hmm. that's, that's my only real comment with this. Mm -hmm. Michael? Thank you. Um, first, I want to just congratulate you guys on the continuing excellence that you are doing and, and meeting the standards. So, thank, thank you. you for that. Um, I, you may have said this during the period of discussion, but I was also looking at some information. I'm just trying to understand: are most of the new um, codings or typical codings being found based off of children that are just in the school district and just going through a process, or are we getting more kids like actually moving into the district? So, um, yes to all of that, I think, is the answer. Um, I think we start with the fact that throughout the year, um, we have specialized educators in, in our preschool, um, in all of our integrated preschool. Every one of our teachers is a certified special educator. And in doing so, they are, are versed at looking at what they're looking at in front of them each day. So throughout the course of the year, some kids don't develop how they should be developing. So they are referred to Sheila to say, we have a few a couple in our classroom and that goes through the process that happening there's also been two years now in a, in a, a, a um, 
increase in the amount we're seeing coming mid to end year. That, that's just interesting. And, and I, how to track that, how to know that we're going to have that is a difficult thing to do because we don't always know where they're coming from. Some from parents, some from early intervention. Um, Sheila's communication is excellent with the feelers out in the community because she's been in place for a few years now and able to do to do that with, with, with knowing what's coming in. And so the answer is yes to all of that. Some are internally, some are from EI, some are parent referrals. So it's all three that have kind of hit us this year, which you've seen the increase in numbers on the chart. Thank you. Cinda. Um, I just had a question um, regarding the process. Um, so I let's say, for example, you had a parent call you of a, let's say, three-year-old child mm -hmm. um, with some concerns about um, his or her development. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, what is the process? Do you, um, does every child then get a chance to meet with someone? Do they bring them into the office, or is it an at-home visit? How do you... Um, <laughs> but I don't, so. Okay. Well, it did, I'll take the information from the parent who, or whoever's referring to us. And sometimes it's just articulation concerns that they aren't speaking as well as the next door neighbor. So in that case, we might just do a speech screening to give them some ideas of things to do at home. Other uh, children who have more significant needs, we would do the whole arena screening and look at any areas on this um, uh, this uh, standardized test to find out which areas are below a certain level for their age. And then we would give them services or develop a plan if they needed those services. So it might be just speech, it might be motor skills, it might be social emotional skills. So we determine which areas are below their age limit and then develop a plan for them, which might be just um, we screen in six months but with some students, they might need to come into program right away if they have some significant needs. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I was looking at your data, and I noticed um, I looked at two columns: uh, total MEEP students in October versus June, and each year is an increase from 2010 to 2017-18 projections, is an increase of 10, 18, 10, 6, 8, 14, and 14. So that means you're going to get practically a classroom worth every year Could from be. the time the school starts to the time the school ends. So that's something that I think, you know, that's that's a run rate for us. So that helps us as, we're, as you're asking us, it supports the data. And um, the other thing was the coding. Um, between October and June, it's plus five, plus 18, plus 13, minus eight, plus six, plus 12, and plus 19. Which means that as as and that really again supports the data you were mentioning before. As you have them in your environment, you're identifying areas um, based on how they're engaging in the classroom. So, mm -hmm. you know, making sure you're keeping those ratios, you know, by having what I would call you know a front load of typical students, and then and it it blends upward. Mm -hmm. So we just want to make sure that you know we are supporting you in. Um, being compliant we know that when it comes to special education there's not what i would call wiggle room we have you know we have to provide the services it's right that we do but we must right. and that we're we're you know giving you the time and the preparation you need and i think this is going to be a great conversation for budget season as well mm -hmm. that we're not having you come every june and now you're going to be hiring in june <laughs> to bring students in um or to bring staff in to support students and get them acclimated because I know the other thing I think that impacts as well to a child is change. Mm -hmm. So making sure they are in and they're settled in, you're, the staffing trained up, um, acclimated to the team and, and ready to participate. Mm -hmm. I think that will help the child as well, all the sure. children that you're supporting. So mm -hmm. as you know, you're coming to us in the fall, you know, or the, the late fall, early winter, as we're preparing for budgets, this data will be very helpful for us to, to revisit, see what you're coming back with, see how the staffing adjustments, whether they're doing meeting the expectations or whether you're just hitting that benchmark again and you think you might need more so that we're, we're front loading you and not having to add staff mid year because I think that would probably be very um, unstable for your environment. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. those are things we have to make sure we're doing a good job from our end to making sure we're supporting you on your end. So this data is very helpful. And I think you know keeping that data you know, in front of us is going to help us to, to do a better job of helping you. Andy? 
So this is a related but not pertinent to this discussion question, so bear with me. Um, I know that a lot of these interviews and, and sort of analysis that you do are done, some of it's done in different places. And I remember from history that, that the, the blue building used to have a very functional first floor to do a lot of testing. Where, where do you do the sort of analysis today? Where, where is that done given the state of our facilities? The weekly child finds screenings are done at Master Kohler Elementary. Okay, and is there adequate space for this? Do you find mm -hmm. it, any difficulties in doing that, anything like that? No, we use a combination of a therapy room and my office at Master Kohler. So the students usually start in the therapy room and we do most of the screening in there and then I interview the parents in my office regarding the adaptive skills and social emotional skills of the child. Okay. So it works out. I'll just add to that, Andy. Remember back when um, I was I was the principal of Master Cola back then when we um, took on used some error funds to put on the playground and we used some, some some funds to adapt our building to be able to bring in preschool and that's when we brought over preschool from some of preschool from Thornton's Ferry to Master Cola. And we created um, kind of a, the lower wing of the building is the best way to describe it, where it is kind of all um, preschool through through first grade, and it's in the lower part of the building. And we utilized a lot of spaces and in, in, uh, split some rooms and did um, therapy rooms and things like that down in the lower wing, and that's still being utilized today for some of these services that are happening. Okay, so. John came to us with a request um, in his letter, and that is to increase two paras from part-time to full-time and to add two part-time teachers to the uh, MEEP program, the early, um, the, the preschool program, and the cost being $80,508 to accomplish that goal. Um, it, is anyone willing to entertain a motion to do that? Cinda? I just had a question. Is sure. that would that come out of then just the existing slated um, special education budget that we already have? Much. Um, as we talked, um, we have the savings within our budget based on what we've been doing with personnel. So we've had a conversation with Linda Hastings, and we are able to make that possible. So it's already covered in the existing budget. That it would we be have covered in just... our existing budget within personnel. Our and personal just... savings. Okay, and then we just, mm -hmm. you just need our approval to be able to move forward. Correct, and, and so it would be lovely if you um, could take that vote tonight, and if you couldn't, we're prepared to wait until June 5th. Again, we do not want you pressured this evening, so um, it do, is at your pleasure. Do we need to waive the two-week? You well, would need to do that if you vote tonight, yes. Um, Andy? It's not a motion. Yet. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, just to, to chime in what Shannon mentioned earlier about budgeting and earlier I know that a lot of this you couldn't have anticipated mm -hmm. but you're asking for two part-time I mean you're, you're asking for four essentially four people mm -hmm. influenced here which is I think more than we've ever seen in terms of a mid-year adjustment so I think that what I would expect as a board member is when we go into budget season next fall that we ask you to use your Ouija board and things a little bit to anticipate so that we put this in the core budget. I mean, we're, we're fortunate right now that because of the way we do retirements and incentives that mm -hmm. we do have a little bit of sl slack, if you will, to be able to capture this. But it's also better better procedure to try to budget as much as you can. And if you even anticipate that you're going to have any extra like this, maybe we, we put it in the budget up front so we just know it. It just makes it cleaner, you know, easier to explain to the voters and ourselves so as we go through the process. So. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot about the, the motion. I think the, the point is, you know, and I would be supportive of doing that, waiving the two-week rule, because tis the season for for movement in personnel. Um, this is, you know, definitely when teachers are deciding uh, to make decisions on their teaching schedule for next year. So procuring talent, this is, I would call it a good prime time. So I think the more opportunity we give to our administration to procure the best people, I think the better off they will be. So I'm looking forward as an opportunity to uh, to get uh, the best talent in our house. So if you would indulge, I think that there, it would be beneficial to the district. Cinda? Um, I'd like to make a motion um, that we grant our approval for uh, the district to hire two additional 0.5 certified special education teachers 
at the cost of 21,972 and the 2.5 para educators that I think it looks like that's an increase allowing to increase from part-time to full-time mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and that amount is 18 <coughs> 282 so the total in each it's 2 times 18 it's 2 times 21 so it's 80,508. So the 80, in the total amount of 80,508? Yep. yep. And waive the two week. Is there a second? Requirement. Seconded by Naomi. Is there any discussion to the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, none. And the motion carries 500. We wish you the best of luck in the upcoming school year and procuring the best talent for these roles. Thank you very much. And we're on to item number six, which is the response to school lunch inquiry. And we invite to the table uh, Dave Zeke, our uh, food services director, and uh, Matt Chevenel. I will let yeah. you take over the mic. Let me just uh, welcome Dave. Yeah. We uh, recently had some inquiry as to our food service program. Uh, there were three main topics covered. Um, the first one was, I'd like Dave to talk about, was uh, eliminating um, an alternative lunch for those that don't have money in their accounts and kind of focus on what is the standard amount that we allow to charge to until something else happens. Um, why don't we start off with that because the other two I want to chime in a little bit more sure. so why don't we talk about that Dave oh thank you uh, can you hear me okay okay um, f probably one of the hardest things that we have to do in the, the lunch program is uh, monitor students accounts and be able to uh, handle all the all the appropriate accounts um, every day um, as Matt had said, one of the things that we do um, do is allow students to have um, charging up to ten dollars per per student. Um, so if they have no funds in their account, um, they can charge up to four lunches in the elementary school and probably three in the middle and high school. Um, at that point, there is um, in one of our procedures is they would receive an alternate meal. Um, which is generally cheese sandwich, tuna fish, and I've instructed the uh, schools to also offer turkey if we have that available. So um, I think um, when we get to that point, we, tr we try to recoup and try to send home notices to the parents. And the cashes are pretty good when the balances are getting low to let the students know. And um, we do offer um, to send letters home, but sometimes they get lost in the mail. And when they get up to the $10 amount, they usually try to make a phone call to the, to the home. Um, one of the things that we do also have in, in the letters is um, the option to sign up for the My School Bucks account, which the My School Bucks has, um, has done a great service to us as far as deposits into the students' accounts. And... Um, at this point, if they sign up for my school bucks, they don't have to use it as a deposit mechanism, but they can also get uh, low balance um, fund alerts on their on their emails. So that's just one more thing that could help the parent um, know when their student funds are getting low. So um, I had just um, talked to all the schools, and I went around and I and the ten dollar. What happens when we have a ten dollar limit is the computer will not allow that charge to go through anymore so that's that's where it becomes really tough so what I've done is change the limit to twenty dollars so if there's any question they can easily put that over to the ten dollar limit and one of the um, one of the things is you know sometimes you get if it's two or three meals and the, the notice doesn't go home in time the parent doesn't have time to respond so I think if if we have that little threshold to get over the ten dollar limit that might help the situation Okay. One of the other topics that was brought up um, is their legislation proposed mm -hmm. to eliminate, eliminate the alternative meal or 
something to that effect, and there is uh, the Senate Bill 371 that uh, requires the school board, I believe it's this school year, to come up with a school, mon school lunch uh, charging policy or a school lunch uh, meal policy uh, that we have to come up with. I think there's some... Uh, a model policy by the school boards association that we have to review and probably bring what we would bring that then therefore before you mm -hmm. but there is uh, some legislation le legislation out there to uh, eliminate this option and David's done some research about other districts who have delved into this category too you don't have to get into specifics now sure. but we're we're looking at that in conjunction with the the school board model policy to see what we could bring before you. So. Marge? Um, I would just add to what Matt said. The, the um, law specifically says that a policy <coughs> should be in place by July of 2017, and it allows a district to do one of two things. You can have a policy or you can have a set of guidelines. So in some cases, a policy might be a little too confining, so the guidelines are offered as an alternative. So I think we'll take mm -hmm. a look at, at each, perhaps, and bring it before you and decide what you think would be better for us. So that will be in the works after mm -hmm. this. Excellent. Okay. And the last item that I had, which, which kind of mm -hmm. goes hand in hand with probably creating procedures or policies, is could one establish a, a fund to take care of those who have gone over the amount that one could charge? Um, mm -hmm. We can't, as a district, establish a fund, but each school has a parent group which could establish a fund, collect donations. They're all 501c3, so there's not an issue there. We as government, we're not a 501c3. But a parent group could do it, or um, the mm -hmm. school office could do it too and have a separate account within their, not student activity accounts, but within their, their checkbook that each school has. We couldn't do one as a district. We couldn't create a fund without a warrant article to create that fund. Yes, Andy has a question. So I need some clarification, <clears throat> at least for me. Are you, when you talk about students that they've gone beyond the $10 and stuff, yeah. are you talking about situations where it's just a parent hasn't had the chance to send the money in and therefore it's just kind of get caught up or is there, are you talking about situations where there's just no money from the parent to be able to do it because it's one yeah. it, it, because when you start talking about a fund it's one thing to say if there's a hardship and the student can the parents can't afford that's one thing if you're talking about somebody who's chronically late and has plenty of money to do it that's a different concept altogether so I'd like to understand if you show a difference between that well, for, the, for those who have issues legitimately paying, there is the free and reduced program. Correct. Uh, and we do involve ourselves in that, that heavily. Correct. Um, it, it, it's kind of hard to draw the line between those who are just behind as far as remembering or suffering some sort of temporary kind of hardship that at the time wouldn't allow them to qualify immediately for the free and reduced program. So I'm thinking this fund, you're kind of splitting hairs uh, where you don't want to get into the, the private issues that some people may or may not have. Uh, but it would, I would think, be for those who are in a temporary situation needing assistance. So this is sort of like each parent group creating sort of like a goodwill account thing to, to help in that without really asking questions and exposing Absolutely. that scenario. Yeah. But, and and I, I don't have any trouble with that at all. I, I think that's good to position it. But I think there also, as part of it, needs to be a promotion that says we're, it's not doing this to, to extend your line of credit and then you write a $50 check every two months or something like that. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it needs to be positioned appropriately as to why this is being done and to reinforce the the way that you do the program to make sure everybody's up to you know up to current if you will i do agree with that andy um because we you know as i said sometimes the the parent sends the check or the deposit um shortly thereafter so 
Um, I would think it would just be more for the hardship case where that and there's no money, no funds coming in at all. So I think I had Michael, then Cinda. Thank you. Um, so a couple of questions. One, um, is it possible to add like an SMS or texting to parents in order to let them know to recharge their account? Is that part of the solution that you guys have today? Um, I think we don't have we don't have the capability in our school messenger system to no, to um, do I think, that. I think the best solution would again would be if they had the uh, my school box account where they would get text or uh, or email okay so the my school bucks account does i would text. check i'll check on the text I'm okay because sure, that might i mean yeah. i just I think, think they, they can download an app onto their phone my school bucks app so that would probably be the quickest and they don't they don't have to utilize it they don't have to put money in the account but they can create an account for themselves mm -hmm. and then it would give them alerts when their balance went down because it keeps track of everybody's balance not just the users correct so yeah. that would that, be an adv advantageous also. Yeah, no. I have my school box, and basically when it gets below $10, I get an alert that uh, there needs to be a replenishment of the account. But mm -hmm. it's an email. Mm -hmm. I, don't get an, I don't get a text. So maybe that's something we can look at, see if text is a capability within it. And I will see if I can download the app before the next meeting as yeah, well, because I haven't been okay. using that. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. Then the follow-up, uh, two additional questions just based off the three items. Um, you're saying the SBA 371 is to get rid of the optional lunch. Does it, I, 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 that's kind of what I heard, but I'm not sure I'm hearing that correctly. It says this bill establishes requirements for implementing a school lunch meal payment policy. That's what the bill is. Oh, okay, so it has nothing to do with the alternative. Because mm -hmm. I thought, okay. Um, and then I have some, um, I guess questions around around creating a fund. I think <clears throat> it, it is an unfortunate situation for many um, that they would have to get to the point where they might have to apply for the free or something like that. But I, I think it would you'd have to be at that point where it, you have to take that step to remediate a, a challenge in life, and we all get there, and there's help there for people. And um, instead of just going to the parent teacher association and trying to Maybe it might be good to fill a gap, but there has to be something so that even the Parent Teacher Association knows that the, that individual needs it. There's got to be some mechanism for them, which becomes a challenge because you really don't want a parent teacher organization touching financial information. So, uh, to me, there's there's a lot of challenge around that creating a fund Large. piece. Um, to go along with what Mike is saying, um, at the high school level, um, the parent group does not raise funds does not collect funds, it doesn't have any funds, it's all of the other schools. So that school then would not be included in that kind of effort. So it just seems to me that perhaps before that we just take a look at what Dave has done already in addition to some policies so we have consistency across the district. Yeah, I just think that there's steps there to help individuals already instead of trying to create another one. Cinda? <clears throat> I'm actually really glad that we're talking about this. This is something, um, this this kind of cheese sandwich thing in our school lunch is, has bothered me for some time. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that, A, I feel like it puts our staff in tough positions. You've got teachers that loan kids money because there's, or or we'll just pay for the lunch. I've right. talked, there's, that's absolutely happening. Yeah. Um, where a teacher, you have a child that's upset, they're gonna get a cheese sandwich. Um, there's a stigma, maybe even a hand stamp. Um, and so I think that fundamentally my concerns around this are that this is an issue between the parents and the district. And I feel like, for example, you know, we don't do that. We don't make alternatives for library books. You know, and food is a fundamental part of their learning. Um, and I also would question what's really the difference in cost between a tuna fish sandwich or the cheese or the fish stick lunch that they might get for that particular day. You know, I, I'd really like to start to understand what really kind of costs we're at if, um, let's say we did get rid of this kind of alternative cheese sandwich, tuna sandwich, maybe some turkey, sure. um, because I, it just leaves me with a lot of concerns for students, um, in, and it also may be an early emerging situation, financial situation with parents. Maybe someone recently lost a job. They don't really know 
um, what resources are available for them, where they can go for help, uh, where they can get the support that they need. Um, so I feel like there's some opportunities there. Um, and so I feel like for me, one step that would be really helpful is to really understand if we didn't have the cheese sandwich that we um, found some other ways to provide um, some increased communication with the parents, you know, such as the texting or some other automated tools that we might be able to use to try to get that balance um, more mm -hmm. forefront with the parents to be able to help them out. Um, maybe we can institute some policies like we do with library books that maybe we don't release the report card until the lunch mm -hmm. balance is up to date um, and maybe some ideas like that. But I'd really like to get away from this notion of a cheese sandwich and an alternative lunch um, for those that um, you know are are having an issue for whatever reason, whether it's their parents can pay it they haven't remembered or that there is a need because it's going to be very difficult yeah. to be able to be that cheese sandwich, please. <laughs> and who gets the cheese sandwich, who doesn't? So I'd like us to really look at, uh, take a deeper dive into what we can do um, so that mm. we're still protecting the district, mm. but yet we remove the children from this equation and allow them to continue with the same nutritional content that other kids are going to be receiving that day. Sure. Michael? I'd like to actually just second what Cinda said. Uh, I think that it's definitely a stigma that can stick out. I know when I was a child, you had to have a different card than other people in order to buy your lunches if you were on the pre free program. Hopefully now it's a little less noticeable based off the programs we have. And however, this one is just another one that I think is the financial um, cost savings probably does not outweigh some of the other issues that we might even be dealing with as a school district, such as bullying or something like that, that might come along with it. So thank you. Um, so I had a couple of um, data questions, but I echo what these mm -hmm. guys are saying. You know, I, I have an eighth and a ninth grader. So, you know, I remember my daughter did come home getting a cheese sandwich because I sent a check in and a hundred percent of the money went into one child's account and hers was in the, in the hole. So she came home, she's like, you said you paid and all these, you know, I got a cheese sandwich. So, you know, it, it, it can happen for a number of reasons, yep. in, including human error. So, um, but it does, you know, it, it, it taught me that there was a, a connotation with it and we don't want to be collection agents through the children. Um, that's yep. definitely something that we want to, I think, I, I feel, and I, I think that, you know, a few of us from testimony night feel, <clears throat> we don't want them in, caught in the middle of that. Um, the hand stamp is definitely also a, a sign. You come home with a hand stamp. You know, the letter in the backpack is lost with every other thing valuable that you should be reading that you don't, you never see. Um, it's just the the abyss. But you know, if there are communication methods, um, I know uh, with parent groups that was an idea. But the concern I have is student privacy. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want parent groups getting, you know, how these funds are used and to whom they're applied. It's it's definitely we don't do that we won't do that, that's irresponsible I think, but then the office accounts has some has some merit because again we talked about the high mm. school, and when you're talking about <clears throat> growing kids, you can't get bigger appetites than kids at the high school, but um, but you definitely want to make sure that you know everyone <laughs> is looked after and and so I'm interested in hearing more about that as we continue our discussion, um, so. The things I looked at were um, based on the number of um, meals that we're putting out, what percentage go through my school bucks accounts, what percentage go through cash? Um, the my school bucks, they put out a, a, a report for me and um, it's probably about 50-50 right now, I think. The um, <coughs> So, but we have power school as well that we can push out a power message. School. We had, uh, as of um, last week, it was $355,000 deposited from my school bucks mm -hmm. as opposed to 265000 by cash or check. So it's, it's a little over the 50% mark, so. um, which is great. And, and I think that saves a lot of um, hassle as far as making sure that the checks go the correct uh, 
uh, students mm -hmm. and that the checks don't get lost in the bags and they're not left in the homeroom teacher's desk and things like that. So, Absolutely. And that's, um, th that would be what I would say is, you know, if they're not, we got a lot of parents signed up for PowerSchool with yeah. communications. Now that they ha are on PowerSchool, we can communicate through PowerSchool on um, the My School Bucks program. But we also have PowerSchool as a tool for those not using the, the My School Bucks program to communicate to parents we have their data. And we can communicate to parents that um, you know, their students have a balance and leave them out of the equation. So <clears throat> I think, you know, I, I definitely think that's where we want to be as a district. You know, I don't think we have a lot of usage of cheese sandwiches. But when Not it much. does come up, I, I think it, it means something. Mm -hmm. And I think as, if, if we as a district can avoid it, we, we should. I have Michael and I have Cinda. I was just thinking, this is totally off the cuff here, but um, why don't we possibly look at an incentive for the children to have their parents sign up for school bucks and give them a free ice cream or something like that at the beginning of the year so that I'm not sure if financially if it's feasible because I think there might be a savings to have them have the school bucks, or, but I know if you give a kid a free ice cream, they're going to bug their parent to probably do something. So <laughs> just a thought. <laughs> Right. Send it it's a nail. Be a smart snack ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of creative things we can do to try to, uh, you know, even get the word out um, when we send a notice home with the parent. You know, do are we sending them how they can enroll? Yeah, um, actually, we just got some uh, literature from my school bucks for the start of school year with postcards and and letters to the parents. So, so I think continuing to remind yeah. them because that's that's one thing. Absolutely. You know, sometimes before people take action, they have to see things more than once. Yeah. I think there's a lot of things we could do, but in the the meantime, one thing that would be helpful to know is, you know, what kind of um, money we might estimate that if we did get rid of the cheese sandwich kind of program, um, what would we would what would we be looking at um, from a range from on the minimum, um, maybe loss to the district to the um, maximum. But I also think that as we increase correspondence, we might we might be able to because mm -hmm. right now when they get the cheese sandwich, it's a free lunch, right? Regardless, they're not paying for it. Yeah. Um, Whereas if we can kind of get them to continue so there's not that break in right. their payment, then maybe we can um, shorten the gap, narrow the gap mm -hmm. on you know, who's getting the free lunches for that day, but at the same time not have to offer the cheese sandwich. It's kind of my <clears> hope <throat> in brainstorming. A well, it'll, it'll be interesting to see if we go, you know, if we increase that to the $20 max, if it's, if it's going to give them enough time to turn around and pay back or if it's just going to increase increase my charge limits so um, we'll have a small window but we can probably see that within the next week or two okay yeah because I definitely would like to know what we think would be you know if we got rid of it you mm -hmm. know really as everything stands now what's yeah. the best case to the worst case from a financial yeah. impact okay. that we would see we would or could see um, and that kind of helps put things into perspective for yeah. me anyways Naomi um, once or twice, the somebody has mentioned diff different people have mentioned hand snapping. Do we do we do that? Because I I would be very concerned if I would love to see that addressed. If that's something that we're still doing, we were when my kids were younger, but yeah. that was before my school bucks came into play, and I was I'll, easily I'll managing it. I'll double check on all the schools, but if there is any situations with that, we'll eliminate it immediately. So that'd be wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Are there any other questions from the board? Uh, this is the first of, I think, a few conversations. We're going to move forward but uh, with, with more dialogue. But, Matt, you had something? Yeah, just, just a point of clarification. Um, okay. As far as the alternative meal, uh, we did have a conversation about that. <clears throat> the law says that no student will be subject to different treatment from the standard school lunch meal or school cafeteria procedures. So the law says the cheese sandwich has gone the way of the cheese sandwich. It's done. Well, it says uh, procedures. So if, if we look at the procedure All we have in place, um, which is if you go over a $10 limit, then there's a, an alternate meal. That's, that's the way I interpret that procedure now. I think to go the the route of eliminating the cheese sandwich is probably the way to go. And if it, if you read that, it says or the or the procedure, I believe, Matt. 
or school cafeteria procedures. Correct. So I agree yeah. with I agree with the fact that the cheese sandwich is not a, a good alternative, and I think that we probably need to look at that. Right. Yeah. Okay. And what we'll be looking for is data. I mean, if we're doing something differently, you know, and that means we're providing the standard school lunch and we're going toward the parents for collection, just giving us data on how that, you know, what, what exposure you're seeing <clears throat> and, you know, what financial support the board needs to prepare for in our budgeting or whether we do something along the lines of a, a donation um, at the school office locations a donation fund with, you know, in the idea of a no fundraiser fundraiser as they do at the middle school for that kind of thing. But just, you know, as we're doing it, we need to, need the data to know what the exposure is. And then from there we can, we can see what <clears throat> will be better, um, better procedures to support how you can recover um, any loss. I think, I think it may vary from school to school because mm -hmm. at, at certain levels, like we do allow charging at the high school as well. Mm -hmm. And we do try to get the kids to come back. And we, we work with the administration um, in order to try to get the kids to uh, to pay back. So um, that's probably the the hardest one because you know, like I know, that they eat more food than the rest mm -hmm. of the students do. So there's more more chance of them to charge. Um, and we do work with the with the administration and the other um, el elementary schools and middle school as well um, when there's circumstances where we would like some help with the parents. So okay, where to come? Are there any other questions or comments while we have Dave in our presence? Seeing them, thank you very much. All right, appreciate it. Thank you. And now we're on to item number seven, which is the update on the homework committee's progress. Mark. Thank you. Uh, so this was this has been an interesting um, <clears throat> time because um, you know the district is always tries to. Um, you know, consider its practices and protocols, and um, you know, we try to you know have a process of continual review so that we don't just get um, too stuck in our past practices or patterns, but you know, kind of review what we do and see if we can improve. And um, one of those um, areas that we've really spent some time on has to do uh, with um, homework and. A related uh, homework as relates to um, grading practices. So this was born out of the development of a our district standards-based report card committee, which is um, convened this year, and uh, we've made some great strides in uh, the research and development of a K to six um, standards-based report card that we'll have much more to tell you about next year. Um, but this process has begun. Um, and in the process of that process, we had to consider lots of other things. And one of the things we considered was um, sort of the tendency that has happened in the district for um, homework to be part of an academic grade and whether or not that makes sense given the standards-based environment that we're in now. So um, off of that, um, we uh, have approached this question in two different, in, in, in two different forms. Um, this question of homework has, and, and grading practices has um, been discussed in the context of our K-6 to standards-based report card committee. And since we don't have a report card initiative at the moment at 7 through 12, we formed a sort of a uh, homework subcommittee of leadership uh, from the middle school and the high school. So department chairs, assistant principals, principals, and so on. So the same issue is being discussed K to 12, but in two different contexts. One in the context of the standards-based report card committee and the other in a standalone homework committee. And these are the things that we've looked at. Um, We've looked at what is the purpose of homework, just flat out. Why do we give homework? What is its purpose? Um, the role of differentiation of homework. So for instance, um, it would seem that um, 
not every student benefits from the same practice. If the presumption is that homework is a tool to use to help students practice things that they need to work on, then that would be a purpose and it would make sense. But not everybody needs to work on the same practice. And so differentiation um, becomes a factor that needs to be considered. Um, also, what is the role in an academic grade? Um, so for instance, the question becomes if a student um, doesn't complete his or her homework and um, the resulting um, uh, effect is that a student gets a zero and that gets factored into a grade, um, but it would appear that the student is doing very well in the class by every other rigorous measure that we have and the grade is artificially dropped because of the introduction of zeros, then that doesn't really paint an accurate picture to the student or the parent about what skills they know and are able to do because the zero reflects a different, stan a different standard like the tendency to you know, do what they're asked when they're asked, but it doesn't necessarily relate to whether you can do what you can do. On the other hand, if a student always does his or her homework and gets hundreds for that, but is still unable to perform rigorously and that refl and so therefore the grade might be artificially inflated, um, it wouldn't be a good rendering of what the student is know, knows and be able to do if we factor in the fact that they just do their homework all the time. So the question is the role uh, of homework in an academic grade. That's been discussed. And then, in general, the effect of zeros on an average. So if a student um, doesn't pass in his or her homework and gets a zero for that, again, the plummeting effect of that on a grade doesn't necessarily reflect um, what a student can know and be able to do. However, um, it is also true that there are um, good reasons to want to record whether a student does his or her homework or not. So we've really discussed um, uh, what might other ways be that a tendency to do or not do homework can be recorded some way so that a parent knows, but not in a way that it becomes so punitive as to conf uh, confuse the academic grade. And so this has been a discussion that we've continued to have. So um, what we've done is we've um, looked at a lot of academic articles on the subject. We've looked at a lot of research on the subject. And um, the charge to both entities, the report card committee and the, um, the 7 through 12 uh, homework committee, is to um, tackle those questions in the spirit of research and best practices and then to work with me on the development of a protocol that we would develop um, that responds to these challenges that then we could communicate both to teachers and um, the parent community to help everybody understand why and for what reasons we'd be contemplating these changes. Um, so we uh, have met periodically at the report card committee and the homework committee for 7 through 12, and uh, we're at a point now where we're going to begin to contribute to the development of a thoughtful plan, uh, consider the practical ways to roll out and ensure compliance with this plan, and prepare for the philosophical reconsiderations that this might, that might be required of some teachers and even parents uh, uh, um, relative to past practice and what people are used to in, in this area. Um, and so, um, we expect to have more to report when we reconvene one final time um, this year, both those groups. And so I come back to the board with um, recommendations on what we're really planning to do. My goal tonight is just to kind of um, get you up to speed on the conversations that we've had to this point um, and, and then to forecast for you that we'll, again, we'll be coming back in the near future with sort of the so what of it. The, culmination. So we're in, a, in the middle of a deep working session right now, pondering these things, reading a lot, talking a lot, and then we'll have more to say, you know, at a later point. This is just an update now. Sunda? <clears throat> Thank you very much for this update. Um, I think it's fascinating, um, and I really commend the collaboration that's happening in the district regarding this and a number of other items as well. Um, but to be able to look at it holistically, um, 
pull in the key stakeholders um, and be able to come up with some recommendations I think is really interesting. I'm looking forward to hearing that feedback. Um, and yeah. Okay. Oh, th I had one more point. And the other, part, the other part about that would be in the situation where maybe there is some remedial attention that's needed and how do we best support those students as part of that as well. But I'm sure that's all part of the same mm -hmm. discussions. But that's um, something that I'd be interested in hearing more about as well. Okay. So I have Zev, Michael, and Andy. Um, I want to thank you for catching us up on this because I do believe that homework uh, is an important issue and it's obviously constantly evolving, so the conversation needs to be had. Um, and further, my other question is, is this the discussion on the issue or is this just to raise the point? Because I want to know if it's important if now is the time for me to share my feelings on homework. I certainly would love to hear your feelings yeah. about the homework. You're running out of meetings, Zev. You're going to graduation. Are you kidding yeah. me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. While this may not be a very popular opinion among my peers, I am uh, totally pro-homework um, for uh, a number of reasons. Uh, one, of the, one of them is because I don't believe the classroom is enough time for students to accurately learn all the material. And to quote my uh, calculus teacher, uh, practice makes permanent. And I do believe that the repetition of the problems in the work actually instills better values in the students and allows them to learn the material um, better. I have personally seen it in some of my classes that um, where homework is optional that kids of equal level and equal intelligence, in, in my opinion, um, perform much, much better when they do actually do the homework. And if you don't make the homework optional, um, if you do make the homework optional, then the kids um, who won't do homework don't tend to do as well on assessments. Additionally, uh, including homework in the final grade decreases the weight of tests and quizzes on the final grade, which I think is really, really important because it reduces stress among the students. And also, there are many, many kids that I know that um, perform poorly on tests because of the stressful nature of the, of the environment. So for those two issues, I am definitely pro-homework. So if I could just comment on that, because I, I don't want to leave anybody with the impression that the question is eliminate homework or not eliminate homework. That's really not the question, although I appreciate you raise it, that's really not the thing that we're discussing because um, I think that you know the issue is um, certainly homework, as I said before, has a place. The question really has to do with um, the way that homework is counted and the type of homework that is assigned. So again, for instance, um, if there are 30 students in a class, we know that uh, in any typical class, there are a variety of needs in that class. And so um, the same homework assignment, this is the argument, we're still working on this, but the same homework assignment um, for you and Dr. Schoenfeld um, wouldn't necessarily be the same that Mr. Thompson and Mrs. Gualiumi would need because they have different learning needs. So if we give the same assignment, then the question becomes, do they both need the same thing? So really the issue that we're discussing is just the differentiation of homework. So I just want to be clear, we're not talking about the elimination of homework. We're talking about um, making it more uh, uh, personalized. Per, right. Um, and and uh, so I just want to be clear because, you know, I, I don't want anybody here leaving thinking, oh, geez, we're, you know, we're getting rid of homework. That's not the case. <laughs> however, however, uh, it does it does matter that we have a discussion about its proper role and function and purpose and we haven't had um, a really good debate in this district for some time I've been here eight years um, and I think it's time that we rediscuss you know why would we be doing homework what is its goal if for no other reason than to recommit to its its purposes so I just want to be clear about that follow -up. Yeah, sure, uh, yeah follow up so would you also be in favor of specialized tests and assessments for the students or just differentiation among the homeworks that are being assigned? So right now we're talking about um, the homework as just the issue on the table is homework right now. Um, and so, you know, that's what we're, that's what we're discussing. Certainly um, there, there are lots of different assessments that I think are, um, you know, that we can, dis that we do now that are, um, you know, performance-based assessments, those are increasing. Those tend to be much more personalized. Um, we're not where we need to be with that, but that's definitely a goal. And we've got, I think you saw some evidence of that tonight. A lot of what you saw tonight was evidence of personalized assessments where students were able to demonstrate what they know. So that's just the beginning of what I think we can do. But the conversation here is just around homework for right now. 
Okay, I lost track of who had their hand up. It was further down there and then the Michael? Like then sub somebody down that Okay, line. Michael then Andy. Okay. I'm usually so good at that. <laughs> I'm sorry guys. Um as you know, this is a subject that I have had much interest in since I've been on the board. Um, I want to thank you for continuing the review of the homework. Um, I think what this allows, uh, if, if with my understanding, is that it allows for um, a teacher to kind of think further about the use of homework and give them the flexibility to actually challenge their students individually. Uh, additionally, I think that what you're working for is an understanding that the child comprehends what they're being taught. Um, and I, I think that based off of, you know, my years ago in um, high school is that a lot of times I was only given the homework that everybody else was given and therefore was able to do it without any challenge or just wouldn't do it and then get a F in homework even though I understood it and got an A on the test. You know, um, I'm being a little over melodramatic here obviously that's not exactly how it happened but <laughs> um to get my point yeah exactly no um but I, I think that's kind of some of the stuff that you're trying to understand as an individual student stuff like that and i, I appreciate it thank you andy so first i'm point my first comment to zev um i graduated from this illustrious high school about a billion years ago um i had the distinct pleasure of being the only male in like the top 10 was the thing number three. Um, my calculus teacher was the woman whose plaque is in the math hallway, Mrs. O'Leary, who was there. And I was one of these, well, you, you idiots can't do homework. Everybody's got to do homework. It's the only way you get right. Um, as I got older, I had kids. And I had kids that were all across the spectrum of learning, all the way from anal doing three times as much homework as he was supposed to, to somebody who went through the complete opposite end. And I think the biggest tool that we can provide is to let the student-teacher relationship dictate when homework has proven that the student is getting the material. Because one student may take three pages of homework to show that they get it, one may do three pages because they want to do three pages, and another can do it, they can't focus, but can do it in three problems and show the teacher that they get the right level that's there. So I like the way you're looking at it. I like the way you're trying to decide. And I'd like to see, like Michael said, to have the teacher be able to have some flexibility as to what to do. Because in some cases, homework maybe does come in to help offset tests. In some cases, it would be a penalty, too. So there's a lot of variables that are there. Um, the only other comment that I would make is I like you talked about all the different people who are participating. I think you also need to somehow figure out how to include either the student or the parent's view into this discussion as well because there are differing viewpoints and things that parents learn with the different styles. I mean, I, being a parent was tenfold more, more valuable than any sort of lessons I've ever learned, you know, in terms of what individuals are. So I'd really like to make sure that that, that gets brought into play there and flexibility is the key, I think, so. Cinda? Again, I just wanted to reiterate, I think, how interesting the topic is, um, especially when you think of how different people learn. You know, some kinetic learners, you know, some auditory learners, and so how that factors in um, with homework and mastering the rubrics, you know, I think it's really, really interesting. So, again, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you come back with on this and more about the work that this group is doing. So I have to say, in my years as a parent, the the parent-teacher conference was always structured about ability versus effort. You know, what do you produce on you know on tests versus uh, what do you produce in classwork and homework, and you know where what what's your potential and how are you reaching it? Um, I think when the kids were young, there was you know we go to parent nights, and they would say we expect you to do no more than X number of minutes of homework a night. Because once it gets past that, it's frustrating. So, and I think you know when you're in the elementary level, it's easy because one teacher's holding all classes. But having you know the high school, you may have calculus where it's you know 45 minutes of homework, and you may have English where it's an hour and 10 minutes of homework. And so, just you know, finding benchmarks to to make it manageable, because I think when you grow up, 
the goal is to have a work-life balance and to just instill that work ethic to have work-life balance, still have a little bit left of your day, but put in the effort needed um, and not make it where you could spend the whole night doing homework. I, I know kids that will get home until they go to bed, they're doing homework, whether it's because they're not, their study skills aren't where they need to be or whether it's because the work is harder for them than it is for maybe their sibling. So we just, I think we need, there's a lot of study, but making sure that a child is measured on their ability, um, again, their, their uh, standards, and that they're being met and exceeded and measured, but you know their effort, making sure that we're instilling um, uh, the right amount of work effort um, outside of class and making sure that as you get to the older grades and teachers are, are collaborating and, and you know we're doing a lot more in that in our, our schools, but that there's an expectation of so much time will be spent in each class so that the student can, can accomplish everything and give their best effort and present what they can produce in an appropriate level of time. So I think that's, you know, that's something that as parents, it's always been the challenge to make sure that we aren't, you know, saying it's okay to blow off homework or it's, you know, because you do okay on tests. I mean, there needs to be that balance. So in structure and, and, and flow. So go ahead. So um, it's almost as if you read one of the articles that we, uh, because one of the um, things that we read had to do with um, consideration of the law of diminishing returns when it comes mm -hmm. to homework. And, and the idea is that, um, you know, <clears throat> one has to always be careful if, um, you know, if you're in math class and you've, you know, at a certain grade and you're asked to do, you know, uh, 50 problems. Um, if, you know, if you are a student who is struggling with the concept and you do 50 problems, what might end up happening is you are repeating a mistake 50 times and that just builds frustration and it, and it practices an error that then gets hard to replace because I'm so practiced in doing this thing the wrong way. On the other hand, so law of diminishing returns on the other hand, um, if you are a kid who, you know, gets it, um, you know, then what the, some of the research says is, okay, you know, I got it, um, I got it after the 10th one, maybe doing 40 more, you know, isn't really going to, you know, because I got it. So, so again, it's not to be flippant about the issue because there are good, good um, arguments on all sides. The question, uh, the, the, the thing really at the moment is just to present to you that we're, we're thinking it's really important to open up the conversation again and just to re-analyze uh, our practices and see you know, where we stand against the research and, and how we can improve. But it's just interesting that you raise that because what you're really talking about in a way is that issue of, you know, you've got to consider the law of diminishing returns and is it really, are we getting the bang for the buck for all the work we're asking students right. to do? And sometimes it's not clear that we are. And, and that's the other thing, just the balance of the different subject areas that they have to engage in, making sure that they're, they know that they're going to do well in this. So they put all their efforts in that and don't spend the time in that because it's really not their wheelhouse that they don't spend the time because like, you know, I'm going to guarantee my A here, even if it means I get my C over here. And, and that's, you know, that's not, that's not a winning formula either. Absolutely. And, and, and if I could just say, because I, you know, I, this is the first time we've said it publicly, so I, I wouldn't want anybody uh, looking to come away with misconceptions. So I will just say this. One of the things that um, even some of our teachers think, and certainly some of our parents think, is that there's an equation between the amount of homework given and rigor, as if, homework equals rigor. Homework does not equal rigor. You could have a very unrigorous classroom and swamp students with homework. So the issue is um, the, the quality and the kind of homework that's proportional, that's related to an individual's needs, and how that gets produced, and then how it gets measured and how it gets recorded. So, so that's the issue. So I wouldn't want people to think, oh boy, they're talking about you know, doing away with homework and that means they're lowering standards. Mm -hmm. Nothing no. could be further from the truth. That is not the case. So the camera is, <laughs> I just want to be clear uh, that, that that really should not be how it's construed at all. It's a reconsideration of our practices so that we get a better, um, it's a crude expression, but a better bang for the buck um, yeah. given what we're asking students to do that is rigorous. So that's the point. So Very good. So more to come, I think. Is there anyone that has questions about tonight's presentation? Then we're on to item number eight.
which now we're in the slippery slope, which is the uh, approval of the May 1st, 2017 minutes. Uh, Andy? Move. Move that we approve the minutes. Second by Michael. Are there any adjustments to the minutes? Cinda? On page five of six, on line number 230 and 231, um, it states, the minute state, Board Member Guayumi suggested that the school board work collaboratively to construct a timeline of the skate park. So I don't remember saying that exa exactly, so I'm just wondering if we could go back and listen to the um, video or audio. I remember speaking about being appreciative with some of the collaboration we've had to date with Town Council. Um, and. I may have said to make sure that it's, you know, that we're collaboratively working with them to make sure the transitions are smooth or something like that. But if you could just go back and take a look at that um, and just make sure that the minutes properly ref reflect what I had said at that time. Any other edits? Seeing none, we'll put the motion to a vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, none. The motion carries 5 zero, zero. We're on to item number nine, which is the consent agenda with Mark McLaughlin. Thank you. So we have several items on consent tonight. The first is educator resignations. Uh, <clears throat> Jeff Capone, videography teacher and technology education department head at Merrimack High School. Alyssa Grise, uh, language arts teacher at Merrimack Middle School. And Courtney Manolis, language arts teacher at uh, Merrimack Middle School. And finally, Emily McElwain, second grade teacher at Reeds Ferry Elementary School. In addition, we have the following educator nominations. Molly DeRoche, grade one teacher at Mastercola Elementary School. And Matthew O'Brien, English teacher at Merrimack High School. And finally, we're very pleased to uh, have the following administrator nomination, Rachel Schneider. Assistant Principal at Reeds Ferry School, and we welcome her to our leadership team. Thank you, Mark. Uh, is there a motion? Andy? My still mic's on. still on. <laughs> it was meant to be. Uh, I move that we accept the um, consent agenda as read. Is there a second? Seconded by Cinda. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, none. The motion carries 5 zero, zero. Congratulations, Rachel. She's in our audience, I get to say it personally, so I'm gonna do it. <laughs> I know it's, it's the occasion. Um, we're on to item number 10, which is other correspondence. Is there correspondence to come before the board? Cinda? Um, I received additional correspondence from a parent uh, regarding the honors classes and placement at the high school. I've been working with Mark on it in, regarding this particular issue, but um, I just wanted to mention it. Thank you. Um, and the board received uh, um, a uh, note from a constituent uh, questioning uh, the curriculum testimony by Merrimack School District to the New Hampshire Board of Education, and that has been answered and addressed. And I received communication uh, based on current events uh, about the use of the uh, drug sniffing dogs at Merrimack High School and when that would kick off, wondering if it would still kick off this year. So, um, and it was just a constituent at large, but um, just let him know that uh, more would come in the future. So, um, that is all I have. Is there anything else? Seeing none, are there any comments before the board? Oh, hello. Hi. Large. Um, I have two. Um, first, I'm going to pass a picture around, and this is of the Thornton's Ferry Elementary School select chorus that sang the national anthem to the House of Representatives on um, May 4th. And it just so happened that on that day, um, there were 356 representatives in the House because they were voting on um, aid for kindergarten, for full day kindergarten. The governor was also there. So our children were able to have their picture taken with the governor at the end of their singing, which was really quite lovely. And you'll notice in the packet that the Merrimack School District was the recipient of a competitive award of $50,000 uh, from the Office of Student Wellness for the good of our social emotional learning that's going forward. Uh, this would be the committee that Julie DeLuca and John Fabrizio are co-chairing 
And so um, this was a lovely surprise um, on May 3rd. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Uh, Cinda. Um, just to comment regarding that update, I think it's really exciting to hear about the support that we're getting um, from the state. Um, that group has done an, an incredible job to date with the leadership and the participation amongst them. Um, they've been before us several times over the last year, and I'm really it's another thing I'm really excited to see where that progresses, but to be able to um, have that support um, for this team, I think is really, um, it's really great news. Yes, Mark, uh, all over the place. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I just wanted to um, say that uh, last Thursday, um, I appeared before the State Board of Education and testified in my role as assistant superintendent um, concerning what has been proposed as the possible elimination of our current college and career ready uh, standards previously or still, but not as widely known anymore as Common Core. Um, and um, actually, tonight was a great example of what I was trying to communicate to the State Board of Education. Um, what you saw tonight uh, were students, uh, although maybe in a couple of cases there was a little factual information that wasn't entirely accurate. Um, the idea is that our students are um, encouraged daily to be rigorous inquirers and to be and to own their learning such that they can apply it. That has been the heart of our work for the last several years, and you've had several examples this year and over the years of our teachers talking to you about um, our work at August Academy, and every part of our work at August Academy has been born on the idea of inquiry and analysis and rigor, and that has come from the um, Common Core State Standards that have been truly, truly rigorous and game-changing for us. And the um, a point that I was making is at the time, the effort, the money, and the training that has gone into um, having our educators um, become fully up to speed uh, on these new standards has been well worth the time and effort. And uh, I think tonight, as a good example, with the science standards that were referenced and the language arts standards that were referenced and the ability of students to apply their learning in ways they can show you, um, is as good proof as any I can I can detail as to the value. So that was the purpose of my testimony before the State Board event that is considering this question of the possible elimination of these standards. Andy? So I'd just like to raise awareness. Um, parent, parents of high school students got notifications directly today, but also on the district website there's also um, a memo from... Um, the district to parents about the um, the activities around uh, drug, drug sniffing uh, canines um, at the high school and um, the scenario between now and the end of the school year. So I would encourage if you didn't get an update of that um, as a high school parent or any parent to be able to go to the district website, sau26.org, um, and there's the the memo is there so you can look at it. I think it's it's got a lot of really good information. A lot of our communication plans are in there and stuff. So I think it's it's well worth the read to understand what we're doing with that activity. Cinda, I think one of the, I, I think it, um, it's great, and the communication has been great so far um, in using the messenger, um, the website, and everything else. Um, the other thing I would suggest we be putting up there is our memo of understanding. Um, that may what. The MOU and the policy are both on the district website. Oh, is the MOU is already yep. there? Oh, yep. then never mind. If you, go to, if you go to the district website, I look under school board under policies, all the policies are there and the memo of understanding and the the, the canine policy is there. So well, maybe a those. link to it. As parents are looking at the it letter, could they could link through to the memo of understanding, which I think helps put a, um, some context. Just, yeah, that's, that's um, fair. But it is, I did look to some see Some foundational the context yeah. anyways. Yeah. Right. But, you know, thanks for uh, working on that, Mark. Any other comments before the board? Okay, we are on to new business. Is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, going on to item number 12, committee reports. Are there any committee reports? Michael? Um, the subcommittee for Parks and Rec in regards to fields uh, met last week. 
Um, I am on that subcommittee to review uh, possible locations for fields. Uh, during our discussion, we reviewed both the Horse Hill Nature Preserve uh, location, and we did actually bring up the 40 acres of school land that had been reviewed by the build planning and building. Planning and building. Um, we felt that it would be beneficial to walk the land uh, as a first step. I went and walked that land on Saturday. Um, and based off my initial individual assessment, which I am no professional field person or anything like that, um, I think it would be prudent for the school district to actually look at that land a little bit further. Uh, I feel that there's a possibility of at least four fields at that location uh, with parking along the hill that actually goes down. Um, I'm not sure if uh, I should maybe speak a little bit further with Marge to review next steps or anything at this point um, to see if there's a, a possibility of uh, going a little further into that. But I know the Parks and Rec Committee uh, as a whole would love to work with the school district to see if there's a, a means to actually look at fields at that location. I think um, if you want to work directly with Marge to uh, establish some baselines, that wouldn't be a bad thing. And as future agenda items warrant from that, uh, we, will, we will do so. Thank you. Any other committee reports? Cinda. <clears throat> um, Andy and I had a, a Merrimack safeguard meeting on May 4th. Um, just a couple of things, a couple of things that we've already discussed to come up at that meeting, such as um, the grant uh, for the, the mental health committee and also the, um, the, the canine search at the, at the high school. Um, the only other thing I wanted to bring up um, was that in the take back event, uh, 182 pounds came in on the take back days that the Merrimack Police Department um, had had recently <coughs> had. <coughs> wow, that's it. But, and, but that, but also there were their normal take because there's a there's a box in there all the time. I think there was another 100 and some pounds that was there from the last month or something like that. Oh, that's right. So you're really looking at like 300, 300 or so. Pounds, I mean, it's yeah. a lot. Oh. It's, it's amazing the amount that they, I mean, it used to be the only time you could do it at the annual event, there was a lot. But now that we have this on this ongoing box, it's always there in the police department lobby, as well as these activities. It's just shocking at how much is there. I think there, the statewide, there was literally 1,000 pounds, mm -hmm. half a ton. Yep, Ed, that's true. One of one of the things that um, Safeguard is is about is creating cultural change in in the community. That's that's the purpose. And so, um, uh, what Andy just said is and Senda is a good example of that because we're collecting a lot even outside of um, the take back days. So in a way, the take back days, you know, have decreased a little bit because so much is being um, brought to the police station. Um, just as a regular matter of the cultural shift that's happening. So so that's proof that some good work is happening, um, and that's the goal. And more to the cultural shift, um, one of the other things that was reported um, by the committee is, um, and more to the, like, like I said, the cultural shift um, to add on, is that in the past, it's basically, you know, there's been a lot of promotion from Safeguard. They've um, given handouts around town. They've put them with prescriptions at local pharmacies. And this was one instance where um, they really weren't able to do that. And the turnout and impact was so great. So it, it it begs the question as if people are getting used to looking for those days, using them as a chance to purge, you know, some some unnecessary, un no longer needed drugs, you know, from their homes. So I think that that was something that the entire committee was just excited about to see that um, how well that the, it's going. Well, it's spring cleaning season, so good time when you find that stuff to go right to the PD with it. So, good stuff. Um, so, the Healthcare Cost Containment Committee met. Um, it was, my goodness, day after our meeting, I believe. Uh, so, it was, actually, it was May 3rd. It was my anniversary. Why did I forget that? And we went up, we updated the, uh, the screenings and biometric um, participation rates for employees. The cost savings that have been achieved through uh, shopping services and um, the more that can be done so there's always more that can be done but um, just you know continuing the education of, of how 
you can get um, ahead of, you know, get ahead financially, get ahead with your um, your health care by uh, utilizing all the programs through um, Health Trust. So it was a very productive meeting, and smoothies were served, and they were very good. And uh, and those are by Rick Grenier, so we had a very healthy snack that day. And uh, we are meeting again the first Wednesday in June. So any other committee reports? Seeing none, we will go on to public comments on agenda items. There is one person of the public left from a cast of thousands. <laughs> so we will close public comments. Uh, take a moment to sign the manifest, and I will entertain a motion to go into non-public session per RSA 91-A, colon 3, Roman numeral 2, sections A, B, and C. Made by Michael, seconded by Andy. Naomi, how do you vote? In favor. Michael? In favor. Cinda? In favor. Andy? In favor. And I vote in favor. Thank you, and good night.